We are here on December 15, 2000 to interview Morris Dees. The interview is being conducted as part of the oral history project of the United States District Court for the Middle District of Alabama, a court before which Mr. Dees has practiced with distinction for more than 30 years. The interview of Mr. Dees is being conducted in Montgomery at the offices of the Southern Poverty Law Center, an organization co-founded by Mr. Dees that has played a significant role in the history of the Middle District Court. Richard Cohen, who as legal director of the Southern Poverty Law Center, has participated in many cases with Mr. Dees, is conducting the interview. Morris, you've lived in the Middle District all your life. Uh, since I was born. Yeah. Tell us when and where were you born? I was born in uh, a hospital in Montgomery, Alabama, but actually my parents lived in uh, Macon County and Shorter, Alabama, so I guess you could say I was born in Macon County and Shorter. 19... 1936. 1936. What was life like, Morris, uh, uh, as a kid in Montgomery County, Alabama? Well, I was born and, and raised on a cotton farm. My daddy didn't have any land. We were tenant farmers. We rented our land from <clears throat> some of the biggest landowners in the county. Pardon me. Uh, the McLemore family, uh, the Belzer family, the Handy family, and and as uh, as we uh, as we got settled in one little house, then so these families had children who wanted to start farming. So my daddy had to move on. They took up the land. When I was 12 years old, we did purchase a, a small plot of land in Mount Meigs, Alabama, and built our permanent home. When I grew up in <clears throat> Montgomery County in the 1940s and 50s, it was really uh, kind of a uh, apartheid system of, um, of life in the South, very much like South Africa. But it was life as we knew it. Uh, blacks were uh, considered really a second-class citizen, but we didn't think of them as second-class citizens. We thought of them as our friends in our community. Uh, you know, I guess I had the distinct advantage, though, of growing up in the community of Mount Meigs, Alabama, greatly influenced by the African-American community of Tuskegee, because in our community we had a, a large number of land-owning black people, and that wasn't really common in the Black Belt. And many of these black people have had on land for, for many, many years, the Lucas family, the Smothers family, and others. And so I had a chance to, 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 to know middle-class and, and upper-class black people. Uh, my daddy was very friendly with, with these people. He ran a small cotton gin, and, and most of these black families that owned land raised cotton. They had businesses. And so I had a chance to see black people in, in more than just field hand capacities. Uh, they were very friendly with my father, and he was friendly with them. Uh, they came in our home. They sat at our table. Uh, my mother was friendly with their wives. And, and that kind of was a, a different uh, relationship than most of the white farmers and their families had with black people. Most of them stopped at the back door. And it gave me kind of a, a respect uh, and, a, and a, maybe a different view. Even though my, my mother and my daddy wasn't uh, liberal or progressive or in the sense of, uh, of, a, of a liberal as we think today, but neither was he conservative either. He was just a guy trying to make a living. My mother was, and he had a partnership in a sense because they ran a family farm together. So we hired blacks that worked in our cotton field. Uh, I worked in the cotton fields with them. Uh, I picked cotton and I chopped cotton and I carried the water bucket. But at the same time, I saw my dad respond to black people in a way that, uh, that I know the other white farmers didn't do. Were you conscious of that at the time, do you think? You know, I think I really was, <laughs> but I didn't like write it down in a book anyway. I didn't say, well, my dad is a, is a, is a great guy because because he'll sit down on the country store porch and, and eat a can of sardines and crackers with a black guy sitting on the bench next to him. <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, the US 80, the only road that, uh, that you know ran east and west across the south at the time before the interstate, ran through Mount Meigs, Alabama. I had an uncle who lived across, had a country store across the street from the country store that my daddy uh, mainly traded. My daddy and his uncle and brother didn't get along too good. What was your father's name, by the my way? My father's name was Morris. What, what about and, your uncle? And my uncle's name was Lucian. And Uncle Lucian had his store over there, and, and I would drive my bicycle back and forth from across the street, uh, you know, just a little two-lane highway, 
because I love my uncle. He had no kids, and he really raised my sister and I. And, and it's like he's his own kids. Never had any kids. And uh, <clears throat> he, I remember one day I was about 12 years old, and I rode my bicycle across and, and leaned it up against an iron pole that held a store porch up. And he was sitting there with a couple of his white buddies. Today I look back, I know they were very racist. And he looked over, and he called my daddy brother. My daddy's the oldest. He says, look at brother over there sitting with those niggers, you know. And I, uh, he's just nothing but a nigger lover. And I remember uh, at the time thinking, wow, you know, what's my daddy doing wrong at the time? You know, and so, uh, but I, did, I didn't really do anything about it. You know, I just wheeled back across the street. My daddy was on the other side of the street. And that was kind of the context <clears throat> that I grew up in this little community. Because these, these black people that, uh, uh, that my daddy was dealing with were intelligent uh, and smart. Uh, many of them had gone to college, mainly Tuskegee in Alabama State. And, uh, and they, you know, they owned and were probably financially better off. I know they were financially better off than my parents were at the time. Uh, and so I, mean, I remember a lot of times in the cotton field, my daddy would do things. I mean, my daddy was a, 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 a guy who, uh, you know, got his hands dirty <coughs> out in the fields. He would put the plows on the tractors, and I'd see him driving tractors, and he had a big mule, but he had a big a horse he plowed. <clears throat> the first time I really was uh, called attention in a sharp kind of way uh, of my daddy's attitude was I was about like five years old, four or five years old, and we had this river place we rented from a big estate in Montgomery, the Lyle family estate. They own land all over the county. And, uh, and this was a 1,200-acre farm. Actually, it's on about 100 acres of cotton. The rest of it was swamps and woods and stuff like that. And they plowing mules. It was about 1943 uh, or four, something like that. And actually, earlier than that, 1941 or two. And we had about 12 mules, and uh, and they were coming in late in the afternoon to the barn to put the mules up. And and uh, and I wanted to ride a mule. Uh, and so the remember Wilson, Mr. Wilson, who was a kind of the barn manager for my daddy on the farm. Uh, he let me get up on his mule after they unhooked them from the plows. They left the plows in the field to come back the next day. And see, I was riding, I was playing cowboy, I was kicking a mule, and finally when we got to the barn about a half mile away, we had to walk them that far across the fields uh, to get to the barn. The mules wanted to get a drink of water. And they went up to an old uh, log that had been hollowed out for a, a well, <clears throat> for a trough, and you had a pump to pump the water in it. And so when the mule got there, I said, uh, get up, get up, get up, go kicking the mule in the side because I didn't want to stop. And, uh, and Wilson looked up to me and he says, okay, Bubba, time to get down. They call me Bubba is my nickname. He says, time to get down off the mule. And, uh, and I said, uh, I don't want to. I want to keep riding. And so he, I, he said, nope, it's time to get down now. And I said, you black nigger, you can't tell me what to do. And, and you know, I'd heard my uncle say a word like that. Well, I looked around behind me because I heard a noise. And uh, my daddy took his belt out. Now, you know, have you ever heard a belt come out of a belt loop? Boop, sure. Boop, boop. You know, you're fixing to get your butt beat. My daddy reached up on that mule, grabbed me by the arm, snatched me down, and started beating my butt in a circle, holding one arm, beating me around and around in a circle. And he told me, he said, don't you ever use that word. And he said, you do what Wilson, he called him Wilson, he said, you do what Wilson tells you to do. Get out off that mule. And, you know, that made a hell of an impression. But he didn't, you know, I didn't become, you know, a card-carrying uh, NACP member the next day. <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't think anything about it. And I remember another incident in the cotton field that was kind of telling. Uh, my job was to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, carry the water bucket. And I had to walk sometimes, uh, you know, half a mile to a well to get the water. It didn't have any electricity at all down there. And I was carrying this, you know, metal bucket with a wire bale, and I'm carrying like two of them. And by the time you walk to the well and got back with the water, people, you know, they drink it up time you got this. Off you go again. In fact, I used to carry a big cloth to put on my hand to keep from cutting my hand. Got back to the field, and it was, it was 110 degrees in the shade. <clears throat> it was about 11 o'clock, and sun right overhead. You know, you almost can step on your shatter. And uh, my daddy was out there, you know, with, the, with his hoe, kind of helping chop a little bit. And, and, uh, and, and I got to the first person to get a water name. He had a, a dipper, a little gourd that cut out like a dipper. And uh, this black lady, uh, Miss Perry Lee, got the dipper, <clears throat> took a drink of water, and uh, put the dipper back. Then I walked up, 
another black man got a dipper, took a drink of water, and then I got to my daddy. And he just uh, picked up the dipper, got a drink of water, and went on. Well, I never really thought about that until really years later. But, you know, here's my dad drinking after a black person out of a bucket. And that wasn't a single white person in our community to ever do that. I mean, if a black person drink of a, out of a Coca-Cola bottle at the country store, I actually saw a white man one time uh, reach down and pick up a Coke bottle. He had, you know, a little small six-ounce Coke like they had back then, and he'd drink out of it, and all of a sudden he realized that he might have got the Coke bottle that some black person had, and I saw him go out to the back door and spit hit what, the Coke out of his mouth and wipe his, wash his mouth out because he thought he'd drink after a black person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't think that, you know, my parents ever told me one single thing about being fair or, uh, or being just or anything like that, but I think it was <coughs> the things I learned around the kitchen table that, that made a difference. And uh, in addition, there was two people that lived in our community that also gave me a different perspective on life. One was an Italian lady named Mrs. Del Porto. Uh, she had married an Irishman named McCarthy, and, but he died. And, uh, and, and my, that was my daddy's, I guess, closest, uh, one of his closest friends. And she ran a country grocery store down in Wall, Alabama. She talked with a heavy Italian accent. And, uh, and my daddy was always friendly with her. And, and she, and she uh, gave me a perspective on, on life, you know, because, it, because a lot of the white people in Montgomery, they I mean they they use words about her. I mean Mountain Meg's my community. They use words about her uh, as they would a black person. You know they would say, well, you know she's uh, she you know cheats people and she's uh, and she looks like a nigger. You know I've heard actually you know that and and like she's and she they said well you know she uh, she gives credit to these sorry blacks. They didn't use the word blacks when uh, the white guy around across the store wouldn't do it because she was interested in, you know, helping people. And I've actually seen her actually back then, you know, give money to people who were who in need. And another guy was a Jewish guy named Gabriel. And I actually never, you know, whatever happened to his family or what, but Mr. Gabriel ran a country store in Mountain Egg, a brick store, and uh, very close friends of my family's. And, and he would, uh, my daddy would always go in and talk to Mr. Gabriel. And I remember my uncles, I had three of them, uh, constantly talked about Mr. Gabriel Jewing people and cheating them and stuff like that, and my dad, you know, was always sitting in his store talking to him, and uh, and always and, and when we have, when we had Thanksgiving and Christmas, we lived in a big farmhouse in this area. The uh, uh, more than one occasion, Miss Katie McCarty and Mr. Gabriel was at our house, and I never know knew about any home they ever got invited to but our home. Marsh, your middle name I know is <coughs> Seligman. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Seligman, yeah. Seligman, the same as the governor now. Seligman, right. I don't know how you pronounce it. <coughs> Talking about Don, Se Don Siegelman. Siegelman. I, right. how, how did you get uh, <coughs> that, that middle name? <coughs> Excuse me, horse here. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure uh, why my grandfather named his three oldest boys after Jewish businessmen in Montgomery. Uh, he was a, my grandfather, Arthur Dees, lived uh, way down in the county. You'd call it down in the sticks. He was on the country roads down near Union Springs, actually a mile or two from the Bullock County line. And, uh, and he had like, uh, ended up having eight kids, and he was a, a sharecropper, but he also was a ca county road foreman down there. His job was to make sure that the roads got scraped and all, et cetera. But in, he named my father after Morris Seligman, who was a, a prominent Jewish merchant in Montgomery. Uh, you know, we didn't have Walmart of the days, and, they, and they, were, they had numerous big dry goods stores in Montgomery. And another uh, uh, man that he was very friendly with was Lucian Loeb. And, and he named my, his, his next son, uh, Lucian, after Lucian Loeb. And he named his next son, uh, I'm not sure they, this person's business in Montgomery, but he named him James Sternberg after uh, uh, a Jewish businessman named Sternberg in Montgomery. And I've never really tried to track Mr. Sternberg down and know what his history is. Uh, I, I can't really say why, you know, my grandfather did this, and my father simply named me after him mm -hmm. and his oldest son, that kind of thing. Uh, but my dad was never not proud of his name, and. Uh, 
In fact, he was uh, very proud of it and, and, and wrote it when everything he wrote, he put, he put that in his writing. And I remember during World War II, uh, my uh, aunts, especially, I remember one of them, my uncle, uh, they had blackouts and you had to pull your shades down so there's no light shining through so the Germans couldn't bomb your house. And I remember 1943 or four, uh, one night my uncles and my aunts telling my daddy that, that he ought to change his name because when the Germans, if the Germans happened to take over in America, they would kill them, you know. That scary? Do you remember? I, I didn't think much of it. I was excited about the blackout. <laughs> you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to shine a flashlight out the window to, to see what would happen. Was your father <clears throat> politically active? Uh, <clears throat> yes and no. Uh, Dad didn't graduate from high school. But uh, he had an a associate, a friend he grew up with, who went to high school with him, that did graduate from high school and did go on to college and become a lawyer. His name was Charles Pinkston. And Pinkston uh, became early on friends of Governor Folsom, Big Jim Folsom. And Big Jim Folsom was a, a, liked to drink bourbon, and, uh, and he was a country fella. And Pinkston would bring him out to Mount Meggs and, and to our farmhouse, and, and Governor Folsom would come at our house, and he had a black chauffeur. I uh, can't remember this fellow's name, if I'll never forget it, but Winston. Winston would, would bring the limo, limo, and he parked the limo out behind our barn so nobody could see it from the highway. And, and <coughs> Governor Folsom and Charlie Pinkston and my dad and a couple of others would sit around and, you know, drink bourbon and, and talk. So that was my introduction to politics. Well, my father, you know, never had much money. Uh, anything. Uh, when Folsom came in, they had various little deals they gave the cronies of the governor. So they gave my daddy a little deal that uh, kind of uh, got him a few bucks. They had these people that acted as agents for people selling stuff from the state, and it was kind of a small deal. So my daddy was always hanging around a capital and hanging around a governor's office. And that gave me uh, an opportunity to become a page in the Alabama legislature when I was uh, like. 14 or 15, I was up there as a page, and, and every, you know, Governor Folsom served several terms, so I was always a page or a clerk, and that gave me an opportunity to, to meet people like George Wallace and, and, uh, and whet my appetite for politics. When did you first meet George Wallace? <coughs> Do you remember? Ooh, I, I, I first met George Wallace in, uh, when Governor Folsom was sworn in uh, in 1952, I believe, it could have been 48, honestly, I can't remember the exact date. Uh, but it, they had the, I know it was when they had the inauguration of, of Governor Folsom in the Coliseum in Montgomery, and it was a big debate because he spent $25,000 to have a hardwood floor made for the whole Coliseum for his, for his inaugural ball, because he invited people from all over the state to come, and it was a you know, dirt floor in there, Cal Coliseum, a brand new thing, and my daddy got an invitation to come, and when uh, uh, we went to the inaugural ball, he, uh, Governor Wallace was there, and my father called uh, uh, Governor Wallace to come over. He, he was Governor Folsom's campaign manager for South Alabama and maybe for the whole state. And he told me, introduced me to Wallace, my daddy did. And he says, I want you to meet Judge Wallace because he's going to be a future governor of Alabama, mark my word. So, uh, did you ever uh, uh, see uh, the governor, Governor Folsom, uh, with your father? Did they, uh, did they let you see them drinking? Oh, yeah. What I mean, do you think? Uh, did you have any thought about the governor kind of getting drunk? Uh, well, with all, your I dad? Remember, all I remember about it, because all, all the men in Mount Meigs I knew got drunk. That's why I didn't take a drink of whiskey until I was 44 years old, uh, because I, I saw my daddy and uh, Charlie Pinkston and Big Jim Folsom and all of them drink enough whiskey to float a battleship off. I mean, they were just drunk. The thing, but the thing I remember about Governor Folsom was not his drinking, because I saw a lot of guys staggering around, but, it was his, but he didn't shave. Uh, a bit like you, Richard, uh, he, he would have, uh, he had this big, thick beard and it would just grow out all over his face and he's a monster of a man, you know, he's like six feet eight, I mean like a basketball player. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I saw him. There's one, there's one minor thing I might mention that I think that here again, uh, I think uh, gave me a chance to be kind of on the, on the uh, front row of history, so to speak. In 1948, when, I think it was 48, when Governor Folsom was sworn in for the, for the first time, I think he beat a man who was a kind of a, they call it silk stocking candidate, a man named Handy Ellis, and beat him who's running for governor. Um, Charlie Pinkston got my daddy tickets to the inaugural uh, parade and the inauguration, the swearing in. They always do it in front of the Capitol and they build these big bleachers and all that kind of stuff. And so I was uh, 
uh, sitting there, you know, uh, like in a very prominent place and, you know, and watching the bands marching up the street and all that kind of stuff. And I remember it was cold as devil in January. And uh, Governor Folsom got up to make his speech, his acceptance speech for the governor, inaugural speech. And he, uh, uh, the part that I distinctly remember, because I was looking down the street and there's no traffic on the street. The police had it all blocked off and the traffic lights were going on and off one there in front of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and, but nobody was stopping, you know, and I was just watching that. We didn't come to town but about once a month to, you know, buy stuff. And Folsom said, uh, you see that traffic light down there? When that traffic light turns red, everybody stops. Black, he said colored people, and white stop. When that traffic light turns green, they all go. He said, now we have got to have everybody in this state participating and everybody in this state's got to vote. Black people got to vote and white people got to vote. And I, that was kind of, you know, I didn't take note as a, as a social studies student or anything like that, but I, but I remember that, I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Your father want you to be a lawyer? Well, no question about it. Um, he told me one time, he said, you know, look at Charlie Pinkston, he's a lawyer. And he brings home checks all the time and sometimes I don't see him do much for the money either. And he told me, he said, hey, you'll be a lawyer because you, you know, you, you'll get yourself, uh, become a judge, and you'll get a job for life. Because my daddy was conscious about money coming in, because you know, if you're a farmer, you might have a good crop one year, and, and next year you might have a failure. And my daddy, you know, when he died, he was $30,000 in debt, money he'd borrowed 10 years before, and all he could really was pay the interest on it. And that money was borrowed to buy the house and the farm that we actually lived in. So yeah, he wanted me to be a lawyer, and uh, and he, you know, uh, that was his whole, you know, ambition for me. Morris, I I know you've mentioned a couple of times um, mm -hmm. uh, country stores, and I know that I guess in the world of Mountain Megs <clears throat> in the in the in the forties they served as kind of a meeting place. Did you have any? Uh, 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 early cases in country stores? Yeah, I did. I had actually the first case I ever ever tried as a, as a would-be lawyer. Uh, there was a, uh, a black guy that worked on our farm named Clarence Williams, and Clarence uh, uh, and I fished together, hunted together, and, and uh, he had a wife and five, six kids, and, and uh, he was one of my daddy's uh, main people that worked on our little farm. Now, how old were you at this and time? And I was like about 15, I guess, 14 or 15 or something like that. And Clarence uh, uh, was not a drinking person, and he's a very peaceful person. He wouldn't hurt a flea. And so on a Saturday morning, uh, Daddy called me out to the barn and said, would you go up to uh, uh, Mr. John uh, Letcher's store up at Shorter, Alabama, his store set, set alongside US 80, and would you uh, 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 bring Clarence home? And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, you know, I, did, I, did, I, could, I didn't have any driver's license, but you know, nobody cared. And this 14-year-old farm boy, I mean, just sent me right up the road in his pickup truck on the highway. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, he's being tried at the JP. They got him up there because they charged him with uh, uh, assaulting the sheriff and being drunk. And I said, Clarence, I, mean, you know, I can't believe you did this. And he said, well, you go <laughs> on up there and, uh, and, uh, and bring him back. You know, after the sheriff's going to bring him up there, he's going to have a trial. He had been in jail in Tuskegee all night. So I got up there, and, uh, and the sheriff was sitting out there in the car, and Clarence was sitting on the store porch, and, uh, and I said, Clarence, what happened? And he said, well, you know, I was driving my car down the road, and he had an old piece of car that, you know, wasn't much of a car. Black people didn't have very many cars, and he, good cars. And, and he said the tie rod came loose, the thing that holds the front wheels to make it guide. And he said, it ran, I ran over and I hit the concrete abutment uh, at the Lion Creek Bridge between Montgomery and Macon County. He used to go up in Macon County and buy groceries. And so uh, he said, uh, I, I hit my head and next thing I know, the deputy sheriff was jerking me around and saying, nigga, what you doing driving drunk? And Clarence said, boss man, I ain't driving drunk. And as I said, well, he told him what happened. He said he threw me in the back seat of the car and slammed his head up against the frame of the car. I could see where it had cut Clarence's head. And uh, there we were at a trial. And I said, well, Clarence, uh, I knew Judge Letcher because we always hung around shorter. And uh, he was a JP in, at the country store. I said, well, I'll go in there and, and tell Judge Letcher what happened. And, and, uh, and, uh, and you 
you know, you tell him what happened and, and we'll get you out of this. Well, the old judge was behind his counter and he was, you know, serving his customers because they didn't have self-service grocery stores and he was cutting cheese off the cheese wheel and selling stuff. The uh, deputy sheriff told Judge Letcher what happened and, uh, and then Clarence uh, spoke up and told what happened. And then before Clarence even finished, he slammed his old cheese knife down. I never forget his old, because we had one in Uncle Lucian's store. And, and you know, it's always greasy on the handle where you the cheese get on your hand, you know. He slammed it down on the thing, says, guilty. He says, I'm, I can't forget to find, but it was like, got a lot amount of money, like $50 or something. He said, he says, uh, he says, uh, Bubba, you carry him on back down there and put him in the field and, and uh, you tell your daddy to send uh, $2 a week up here. So we walked on out of the store and we're driving on back. I said, Clarence, man, I said, I'm sorry about that, you know. And he, you know, he's a humble fella. And he said, well, he just took it, just took it as, you know, that's just life, you know. And I said, well, you know, sorry about that. I wish we could have done something. Because I'm thinking, you know, I'm Morris D's son. And I'm, you know, I ought to be able to tell the judge something. I know Clarence, but the judge didn't pay a darn bit of attention to me or anybody. And he, uh, so we got back to the farm and, and I was rather upset. Because, uh, you know, I, I I picked up, I remember picking up a rock and throwing it up against the side of a tin barn. We just built a new tractor shed, and, and uh, Daddy was still out there putting planters on the tractor and uh, getting ready to, to do the, you know, they were going to do a little work on the Saturday, and Clarence was going to help him. And, uh, and i never forget, he said, uh, he told me, I asked him what happened. I told him. He said, well, Judge Letch is a pretty tough judge, you know. And uh, I said, well, I don't, Clarence wasn't guilty. And he said, well, you know, you want to do something about it? And I said, yeah. I could have been not 15 or so, 16. He said, well, won't you be a lawyer, you know? And I didn't, you know, I didn't think much of it, but that was my first case. What year did you go off to college, Morris? Uh, 1955. Uh, uh, and how old were you at the time? I was uh, 18, I guess. Off to the University of Alabama? Went to the University of Alabama, right. Uh, when you went there, uh, uh, what did you major in? Uh, majored in business, but I didn't plan to go to college. I was going to farm. And, uh, and my, uh, I got graduated from high school and told my dad I was ready to farm. And he said, well, you know, there's just not enough room on this farm for two folks. And uh, I looked around to rent land, and people was farming fence row to fence row. So there wasn't any land available to farm back then. And so mother called the University of Alabama, it was like in July, and uh, to see if I could get in. And they said, bring him on up there. And I'd gotten married actually, you know, my, when school was out, at, you know, high school. And uh, my high school sweetheart's parents were going off to Germany, and he was a colonel in the Air Force. So we decided to get married because I was going to farm. I wasn't intending to go to college. I had a scholarship for Auburn University to study agriculture. I had been elected. Uh, uh, a high honor with the FFA, Future Farmers of America, for all my farm projects I had on the farm. And, uh, but I didn't think I needed to go to college to learn how to farm. But, uh, but, I, but I, did. I went to the University of Alabama and uh, rented a little apartment and uh, started. Were you, you said you majored in business, but were you interested in being a lawyer then? <clears throat> oh yeah, I didn't, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get on a degree track program. Uh, I was a vocational student in high school because I was going to farm. I was a vocational agricultural student, so uh, when I got to college, uh, I already knew what I wanted to be. I said I'd be a lawyer. And so they had a program that you didn't have to get a degree to be a lawyer, and I wanted to get it quick as I could. And so after you, if you, all you had to do was finish, I think it was like two years undergraduate, or, or enough hours anyway. I did it in two years. And then you could automatically <coughs> go to law school. So that's what I did. So you didn't have to get a driver's license to drive, no degree to go to uh, become a lawyer. That's right. Those were different days back then. But I never did get an undergraduate degree. <laughs> what you majored though in business? I could have gotten one. You, you, when you finished your first year of law school, you're supposed to get a degree, but I didn't have enough hours in undergraduate, and so they, you know, and then, you know they mailed me a degree 20 something years later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you were a business major in college though, weren't business, you? Business, oh yes. And uh, did you have some businesses yourself in college? Oh yes. Tell uh, us about that. Well, uh, when I first got to college, uh, uh, you know, I had a child that came along about you know, a year or so later, and uh, I had a lot of farming projects back on the farm. I had purchased some 50 head of cattle by doing little things on the farm. I had a chicken processing business and sold cotton and watermelons and, you know, pigs and every other thing. I had a nice little nest egg 
of money. I had like ten thousand dollars in the bank in 1955 when I graduated from high school, and it's way more money than my father had. And my goal, you know, if I was going to be a farmer, was to have money coming in all the time, not just one cash crop, cotton once a year. You know, if you you know you perish or, or you do well, and so I had I had all this money, ten thousand dollars, and that was a lot of money in 1955. And so I uh, started this school, and uh, and you know, and I and I. I wanted, you know, not to spend my capital, so I, I kept that in the bank. In fact, I, I gave my daddy my 50 cattle. I just let him have them. I told him, you know, you, you take these and, and uh, send me, you know, a check every once in a while from the calves because I couldn't run those cattle way up there in Alabama. And so, uh, so I decided that, uh, that I would, uh, you know, find some jobs to do around campus. So I, I started looking around, and all I had was like 50 cents an hour, you know, kind of job, working in the dormitory and stuff like that. I sold sandwiches in dorms for some company doing that for a while, and there's no way to make any money. And, and one day, um, uh, it's in December, I'd never really been outside the state of Alabama in my life up to that point except to go to the beach once a year in Florida, and I'd never been to any other state. And, and uh, I was very lonely to be away from the farm, and my birthday's in December, so my mother sent me a birthday cake in a tin, like, like you sent a fruit cake in. I love fruit cakes. So I was sitting there looking at that fruitcake one day, and I'm thinking, uh, as I looked at it, wow, I bet you everybody else is just as lonely as I am up here. And if I could get the list of every student and the addresses of all their parents uh, and all, I could start a birthday cake business. And I don't know why I thought of that and why I thought of using the mail, but it did. And uh, make a long story short, I found a way to get the names of all the students, parents, and their birth dates. Uh, it all came because people had to fill out a card for the news bureau. And it, for the job of sorting the card and putting it in alphabetical order, the guy let me have the names. And I started Bama Birthday Cake Business. Uh, I met a young man about that time who came along a little after I started the birthday cake business. Uh, his name was Millard Fuller, who became <coughs> a, a young guy from Auburn, who later uh, uh, went in business with me and who now is the founder of Habitat for Humanity. Millard and I was in business together. So you know, I had a baker bake the cakes, and uh, and and while I, so while I was in uh, uh, college uh, studying business, I got a PhD in direct mail by by learning the ins and outs of why people respond by mail, which later you know has affected my entire life. Was the cake business lucrative? Well, it was lucrative in the sense that I got a free education, and you know, back then uh, it pulled an incredible 25% response to everybody we mailed a, a letter to. Uh, today, that would be unheard of, but it was a pretty, pretty unique market also, and we had a, we devised some pretty unique selling strategies. We, but that meant you sold like six, eight cakes a day, uh, eight, ten, you know, not many, and you know, and you only made a few bucks a cake. But it was a whole lot better than picking cotton. I know that. Uh, <clears throat> now, Millard, was Millard a couple years older than you, a couple years younger? And Millard's a year, a year or two older than I am, right. A, U University of Alabama student as well? Right. And so when did you graduate from, uh, from uh, college? Uh, graduated from law school in 1960. Okay. And I started in, in 55, <laughs> September 55. Uh, tell us about the, uh, uh, did you pass the bar on the first try? Well, actually, I had an affirmative action card, Richard, uh, that I was able to use uh, <laughs> It, when uh, I went to take the bar exam. Uh, in fact, I used it several times before. I used it when I went to vote the first time, and a lot of blacks were sitting out there uh, filling out forms to vote, and the, and the lady that headed the voting thing in the courthouse knew my daddy. She said, call me Little Morris, because my daddy said, Little Morris, you come on back here. And I went back there, and they signed me up, you know, and I walked right past all these blacks. I didn't think a thing of it, because that's white privilege, you know, and I didn't think, think a thing of it. <laughs> But I guess that she saw my affirmative action card. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to the, I really thought I had to take the bar. But I was disabused of that idea pretty quick because it's just University of Alabama Law School. That was the only law school in the state that was full accredited law school. I was told that uh, I didn't have to take the bar exam uh, to get in. And I'm sure if, if I was white or black and went to Harvard and graduated, I'd have to take the bar exam. But over the years, I've always told people who uh, have questions about affirmative action, I always say, well, you know, I showed them my affirmative action card. And, you know, a clever fellow like you can figure out quickly, it was simply the color of my skin. That was my affirmative action card. But nobody concern was too concerned about it because we had the, you know, the power. And, uh, you know, small point, but uh, it wasn't lost on me.
it wasn't lost on me. <clears throat> Mars, when you graduated from school, did you, uh, what did you do? Well, immediately when I graduated from law school, I had this big debate over whether I wanted to leave Tuscaloosa. Uh, Millard Fuller and I had amassed a small real estate, uh, quote, small empire with a little e. <laughs> we owned uh, most of the city block, and we had, we rented to some 45 or 50 students, and that was a lot of money coming in. And I, we probably had a net worth of a quarter of a million dollars, you know, in 19, 1960. And then we had a, a, a new mail order business. We started selling products to clubs around the nation for fundraising. And these, these products range from uh, uh, holly wreaths that to be sold by Boy Scouts and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And they resold them to make money and candy and all those kinds of things. And it was a very, very lucrative business. And so, you know, for, you know, in, that, in those times, we, you know, we probably, my last year in college, with all the business ventures I had, Miller and I probably made between us th twenty-five to maybe fifty thousand dollars, and you put that in a day's dollars because the governor of Alabama wasn't making like twelve thousand dollars, and I remember the president of Alabama Power Company made less than twelve thousand dollars. So I mean, you know, that was a lot of money, and I remember telling my dad, I said, you know, I don't think I want to come to Montgomery, and he said, boy, you ought to forget about all the little old things you know you're doing up there, and come on down here and practice law. So actually, I probably came to Montgomery to practice law more out of deference to my father who always wanted me to be a lawyer than I did for real love to practice law. Uh, I say that in one sense of the word, <coughs> but in another sense of the word, law was more my passion than it was Millard's. Millard had no real interest in, pass in really practicing law. Even Millard was a lawyer? He was a lawyer, and a very good lawyer and very smart. Uh, and, he, and he was like really into the intricacies of business and the bottom line for my, my interest in business was I was the creative person. I came up with these ideas for these things, and, and, uh, and I was more of an advertising, copywriting person. But, but I always envisioned myself as being a lawyer, so I can't just blame it totally on my daddy. Uh, I actually, you know, in, uh, in law school, I remember I was involved in law, and, uh, and I never forget my first case uh, was a case, in, uh, a personal injury case, that I got before I ever had a law degree. And my father was, I guess he was my runner, so to speak, if, if you could have such a thing, because he wanted me to have a good case. And I, there was a car accident out on US 80 in front of our house. And, uh, and there was this, this black guy named Red. And he had a mule and wagon he rode in. And everybody <coughs> knew Red. He was kind of a reddish looking black guy, light skinned. And, and he was riding along US 80 in his mule and wagon right in front of our farm. And a car came up behind him. Some Yankees are driving it, and they don't know, realize that a mule, you know, and wagon is almost not going any speed. And he slammed into the back of his mule and wagon. I mean, my last year in law school, knocked red out in our cotton field side of the road. And uh, and my daddy happened to see the whole thing, and I and I heard about it later. And he came running over there, and red was getting up. And dad, daddy says, "Get down, get down, lay down here. My boy's a lawyer. He'll he'll he, he can help you in this." <laughs> And so, and so my daddy understood a rear end collision, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the liability problem there. And this, this Yankee fellow was running around, couldn't hardly understand his accent, apologizing and everything, and he had insurance and all that kind of stuff, and he was in some big old car. And so I remember daddy told me later that uh, they heard the ambulance come and they had to call the ambulance, because daddy knew that he ought to go to the hospital. Red was going to get up and run home, you know. And, and so they carried Red. The ambulance was coming, and, and they, when the siren started, because they had no ambulance for black, they had to use Ross Clayton Funeral Home, and, uh, and the black people always joke, you know, when they hear that Ross Clayton Funeral Home siren coming, you know, you better go. <laughs> and so Red was getting up moving, and Daddy was holding him down. So they finally got him in the, got him in the uh, uh, thing and took him up there and x-rayed him, and, you know, he was all bent over and contorted through his life. He's, he was kind of walk with a limp, and his spine looked like a fish hook. But I remember looking at the x-rays later. But that was my first case my daddy got for me. And I had to get a lawyer named Joe Booth. He was a lawyer my daddy knew to hold on to the case till I got out of law school. So that was my first case. And I remember, and never will forget, uh, uh, I settled a case for like $2,000, which is a lot of money. That was a settlement for it. And, and I remember getting the money, and, uh, and my part of it was one-third, Millard's part and my part. And we got the money in $100 bills. Because Red, you know, you know these black people have checking accounts. And I took the money in a paper sack and called Red up to Gilda's Country Store at Mount Meigs and to get his payoff. 
and in front of everybody there, because everybody knew Rev was being represented by Lawyer D's, and I had, you know, had him a stack of, you know how you put $50 bills in a packet? Well, I had a pack of them, stack of them this high. Now, here are people sitting there getting paid off for working in the cotton fields, getting $12 a week, and Red had this stack of money. And, that, and I keep putting that money out on the counter, his eyes got that big. And, all, and everybody was watching. I mean, it was Saturday, and it was like 50 people in and out of the store. <clears throat> You counted slowly too. You counted. I just laid it out. And, 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 Red, and Red walked off that money. I heard people say, "You don't, don't put that money under your mattress, man. The house might catch on fire." Anyway, so that was the beginning of my law practice, and you know, and it boomed after that. I mean, I got all kind of cases, you know, mainly personal injury, representing people is what I really want to do. <clears throat> Let me go back to something I, I think I, I overlooked, <clears throat> Morris. Um, uh, did, tell us about the 1958 uh, uh, gubernatorial campaign, uh, the 1958 election. Did you have any role in that? Oh, I did. Definitely did. Tell us uh, about that. Well, because uh, uh, I had ambitions politically, you know, I thought maybe I'd want to be governor of Alabama and maybe United States senator, but governor of Alabama, I think, really, because Governor Folsom was governor, and I saw that big limousine come and, you know, bring him out to the farm. and. And actually, in high school, I dated his daughter, Rachel, and so I got to go down to the mansion a lot. And, uh, and I dated uh, later Cornelia, you know, the governor's niece, when I was in high school. And it was, you know, it was quite a thing to go up to the Capitol, that big building, and walk in the kitchen and, you know, in those big refrigerators and walk all through the mansion, you know, and all that. And I'd been in the Capitol, and I went to the governor's office. I could run in and out of the governor's office like I was the governor's son, you know. They loved my daddy. So I thought I wanted to be a governor. And, uh, and daddy was excited about that, too. And so in uh, 1958, uh, Daddy asked me, and Charlie Pinkston really was my guiding political light. He said, come to Montgomery because they're going to have the Democratic Convention in uh, the Exchange Hotel. It was a big hotel down here, and it's gone now. And, uh, and, and uh, these are Whitley one, one of the big hotels. And so he <coughs> said, you come down here, and, uh, and won't you meet some people? So I got there and came from, I came from the University of Alabama. In fact, I was fixing to go into law school. And, uh, and Charlie Pinkston said, well, now, uh, now we want you to work in the Wallace campaign. And I was naturally, I was very excited about that, you know. And they said, and, and George Wallace and his brother Jerry, a friend of mine, a very close friend named Sag, and he was in, he was in college too, and he said, if you uh, come down and work for George Wallace, uh, we'll put you in charge of young people for the state of Alabama. Well, Wallace had come to the University of Alabama at my request to talk to a pre-law society group that I had started. And, uh, and, and through his brother, guy to come up there before that. And uh, so, uh, so I kind of knew him a little bit. So, and, that was, and, and he was a perfect you know, fit politically for my daddy and Charlie Pinkston because he was a, you know, a populist and he was a liberal uh, type person. And, uh, and he was running against that time a man named John Patterson, who was the Attorney General of Alabama, who uh, Mr. Patterson is a fine man, and in later life he became a very progressive individual. But back then, though, he had the support of the Ku Klux Klan, and he had filed a suit to stop the NACP, attempt to stop him from doing business in Alabama. And so my daddy, uh, you know, working for Wallace was a, was a good thing, and, uh, and the black people in our community were for Governor Wallace, and, uh, and Winston, his aide and assistant at the time, had really corralled whatever black support that Wallace could get. And so I became, you know, Wallace's... Uh, the student uh, coordinator, I guess you could call it, but I was really just, I really wanted to work, you know, and do something politically. And in addition, uh, uh, they asked me if I wouldn't run for the Democratic Executive Committee at the time. That's the, you know, I think each congressional district had like five or six people who served, that got elected voters, so that I got on the ballot for that. But also, I had to have wore two hats because MacDonald Gallion grabbed me. Uh, he also knew my father, and, and he asked me if I wouldn't be his campaign manager. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, and Jerry Wallace said, that's okay, you can, you can help both of us. And so I, uh, so I, I was actually officially MacDonald Gallion's campaign manager, and Wallace is kind of on the side, student coordinator. And, uh, and I don't, then I put, they put my name on the ballot for the Democratic Executive Committee. And uh, the next morning, Sunday morning, my name came out in the newspaper. And I, w I was put on a slate by MacDonald Gallion, along with a guy named Frank Mazell, and, uh, and it was like a, 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 I don't know what they call themselves, states' rights Democrats or something. Strom Thurmond fell up in South Carolina and led his walkout in 1948, and they had this 
thing, and, and George Wallace was a delegate in 1948, Alabama delegate. He didn't walk out when Strom Thurmond walked out in objection to the Democrats trying to have a civil rights plank. So my daddy <coughs> saw that my name in there, and it didn't mean much to him, but it wasn't long before Governor Folsom called my daddy. And he said, what's your boy doing on that slate with the Frank Mizell and those uh, states' rights Democrats? And uh, get his name off of there. And so, and I said, well, you know, I told Daddy, I said, Daddy, I didn't know one way or the other. I just put on the slate Mr. Gallion put me on. Well, the next thing I know, it was that Sunday afternoon, I went, I went to a law office in Montgomery to talk to some people, and I remember Mr. Hobbs, Truman Hobbs was there, and uh, uh, Copeland, and uh, a couple of more of them, and it was in, down in the Professional Center Hospital building, and, and, they, and, it was, uh, and they got me switched to the, to the Democratic slate. And it got me beat <laughs> because I was because the other slate beat us. But that was the beginning of my connection with what I what's called progressive liberal politics in Alabama. Uh, I, we went to see a man down in uh, Brantley, Alabama, who was a, a, a staunch, quote, yellow dog Democrat. And that's how I met Truman Hobbs. And that's how I met a lot of the people that were tied in with Senator Sparkman and Senator Hill mm -hmm. in Alabama. And that was my first and only political campaign. <clears throat> Now, when, back to graduating from law school, Morris, uh, <coughs> did you uh, uh, open up a law practice? Uh, immediately. Uh, in fact, I rented uh, a building, uh, an office from uh, Aronoff Realty uh, in, called the Washington Building right across in front of the, Fed the Montgomery County Courthouse, uh, even before I got out of law school. Miller, but before the building was even was being built, we got several offices in there. And uh, across the hall, a neighbor was George Wallace and his brother Jerry, and down the hall was Leon Capuano and a whole number of lawyers in that building. And so I got out of law school to practice law. I made the decision. I sold all my real estate in Tuscaloosa, Millet and I did. I took the cash, uh, paid cash for a house in Montgomery uh, out on the Bone Road to live in, and, uh, and pretty much decided that the business was over. We did, in fact, keep uh, our fundraising company, uh, Heart of Dixie Products, which later became full of fundraising, because we, it was easy to run, and we decided we'd, we'd just run that for a little while. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of, uh, and so I was in my office, and one day my daddy walked in, just always bringing friends down to see my office. He's real proud and all that. And I'd been out of law school only a couple of months, and he brought a man in uh, whose, whose name slips me now, uh, Plaz Looney. He was a, a, a PR, <coughs> I think he worked in the governor's office and he was Wallace or somebody and he was kind of a political person and he had a good friend named Aaron Aronoff and, uh, and, uh, and had a good friend named Hilly Aronoff and so he said well you guys are selling fundraising Mr. Aronoff sells cushions for stadium cushions you know you sit on a stadium little polyurethane foam stadium cushions he said won't you guys sell these things for fundraising and so I said well uh, you know we just kind of out of this business well go up and talk to Mr. Aronoff so we go up and talk to Mr. Hilly Aronoff, who had a company called Fabrics Incorporated, and he showed us the little cushions, and they only sold for a dollar, but there's no profit in it. The group couldn't make any money, a civic, civic club, the JCs couldn't make enough money. And I, I look, I said, what are those things about Mr. Aronoff? And he said, those are tractor seat cushions. Tractor seat cushions? I said, yeah, because I, well, you know, I always sat on a hard metal seat, and I wish I had seen that thing when I was out on the tractor, but it was a nice shaped up thing. You, you took a drawstring and set around the tractor seat, and that's before they had air-conditioned tractor cabs with big cushy seats, and they used them for hay rakes, and they, you know, and he made them and sold them through like uh, Sears catalogs and farmers feed stores. I said, "What's that thing sell for?" He says, "Well, I don't know." He said, "You know, wholesale, I get like a uh, dollar for them, and, uh, and and you know, yeah, put things in inflation today, that'd probably be like ten dollars a day, you know." He said, I get a dollar for it, and uh, I said, well, what's it retail for? He said, oh, $3.95, $4.95. I said, well, I think I can sell those to future farmer chapters around America. And uh, if you can sell them to me for a dollar, and if you'll make them and you'll drop ship them, I'd like to try that. And, uh, and I'll sell it them for, for, for $2, and they'll sell it for $3. Well, <clears throat> everybody makes a dollar, and it's a good deal. Well. So I went out to the future farmer chapter because I was, I said, I was a vocational agriculture student in college. I didn't get a, I mean, high school, I didn't get a regular high school diploma. So I go out to Lanier High School to the future farmer chapter, a future farmer VOAG program, and told the head of the future farmers, what, do you think future farmer chapters around America would sell these for fundraising? 
they had barbecues, typical fundraising. And he said, well, that's a good try. I said, I got an idea. Um, going back to my, my direct mail skills I learned in selling birthday cakes, I said, would you write a letter to each of the 15,000 future former chapters in this nation? And would you tell them that you got a former student who's got a new business selling tractor cushions? And he said, uh, <clears throat> I'd be glad to do it for you. <clears throat> Actually, I wrote the letter. To me, it was just like writing 15,000 parents, you know. And so, uh, and, and he says that, he, in his letter, he said, well, he's going to send you a sample tractor cushion. And in addition, I can tell you it's a great project because my future former chapter just got to trying to sell them, and we sold 500 in a week. I mean, and he did <coughs> actually have a little sample sale to see if it'd sell. So I thought, wow, this, you know, this might work. I go back and tell Mr. Aronoff, I said, Mr. Aronoff, I mean, uh, how many of these things can you make? And he's, I'm thinking a 25% response from birthday cakes, you know, I thought this would be phenomenal here. I didn't understand the real world of direct mail, you know, 1% response. So I go out there and he says, well, no, I sell like 50,000 of these things maybe every two, three years, you know, and he sold a lot of cushions and pillows and everything. It's just one little line. I said, I think you better gear up, sell some of these things, man, and, and you get your little nog of hide and all that junk in you need to make them with. And, he said, uh, okay, I, he didn't much believe me. Well, I, I flew to Michigan and talked with Ford Motor Company into giving me a tractor as a, as a giveaway to the future farmer chapter in America who could sell the most tractor cushions per capita. And if you, Ford Motor, first time I've ever been out of Alabama, first time I've first time been on the airplane, I go to Dearborn, Michigan, I walk in there out of the blue, talk to this guy, and he, you know, he did it, you know. And uh, so here we're sitting with this picture, this nice little Ford tractor, because all these future farm chapters around the country had little farm plots everywhere, except one like a big city like Montgomery, and Ozark, and, and, and so uh, we sent the free tractor cushions out. Mr. Locke wrote his letter, and uh, it was very successful, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the end of my legal career and as, what year, as a traditional what, lawyer. What year are we in now? Probably about 1961 or two. I've been in law school one year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we sold 50 train car loads of tractor cushions, and Mr. Aronoff had to, you know, call in the help of other manufacturers in the country, and it, you know, and and, it, and I mean, we was on the road then to, you know, big business, uh, but you can only make so many tractor cushions, and they were tractor seats metal were obsolete real quick, so we hit a nice little niche, and we did well for the time being, but one thing uh, came on after another, and the thing that really made it all work was. Uh, we began to sell cookbooks for fundraising. What was the name of this business now, Morris? Uh, the name of it was, uh, the overall company name was, was uh, Fuller and Dees Incorporated, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it had uh, several divisions. We had Favorite Recipes Press, became the largest publisher of cookbooks in the country, and basically it was sold through clubs and organizations. We got the Favorite Recipes of Republican Wives, of Methodist Wives, of Future Homemakers of America, and, and we, was in, we sold like six and eight million cookbooks a year. And, and this was, was yeah. Millard Fuller, right? Right, Millard Fuller. Right. <coughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so we that that was uh, we, so we closed our law practice in 1963. Uh, we moved into a, a big building, and uh, you know, and ended up building quite a big company. I ended up with about 250 employees uh, and offices in Chicago for publishing more complicated books like space encyclopedias and also by mail. Uh, Life Cycle Library, Sex Education for Children. It was sold through World Book and My Weekly Reader and uh, Gloria's Encyclopedia and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a traditional mail order business and, and publishing became the main stay because, you know, here again I'm the idea person. I think of an idea to publish and, and then you can wrap paper around an idea a lot easier than you can wrap foam and, uh, and, and sewing and all that. It's too much cost in it. Paper products are cheap. So you can produce a book for 50 cents and it would sell for $4. I mean, it's just the nature of the book <coughs> business. So it was, it was enough margin for us to make a lot of money and for the, the groups and organizations to make a lot of money. Morris, when, um, when was your first case in federal court? Uh, Richard, I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering. Uh, they say when you get old, it's three things to go. First thing is your memory, and you can't remember the other two. <laughs> well, uh, Richard, I had, I think probably my f first case was uh, 
probably representing one of the men who was involved in the Freedom Rider incident. I think that was the first case. Uh, it, it was, uh, the Freedom Rider's a very famous thing. It happened in 1961, I believe. And, uh, and I had a, a uh, neighbor, several neighbors that, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in my community that, uh, that had a friend named Claude Henley. And I was, I mean, I was running, you know, I was doing business and practicing typical law. And Mr. Henley uh, uh, was a salesman for a Ford company in town, uh, the main Ford company, I think Courtesy Ford or someplace. And, and he had gotten down there in the street when the Freedom Riders came, and he wasn't attacking the Freedom Riders. That wasn't his role. Uh, and I probably was sympathetic with him, but he wasn't attacking them. He was in, down in the street behind the bus station and, and just, you know, because Ford Courtesy Ford wasn't far away, and he walked down there. Big old burly guy, smoked a cigar, a big fella, typical, looked like a typical Southern sheriff. And, and there was a picture of him in Life magazine. <laughs> I'll never forget a double truck spread, and he was kicking Douglas Kiker. The, the reporter? The reporter. I believe it's Douglas Kiker, tall, skinny <coughs> fella, and he was kicking him. And so naturally, they arrested the old Curtis. They arrested him. The Montgomery police trying to be fair as they could, uh, even though they was under the gun because they allowed, at least the feds claimed they allowed the Klan to, to come in and beat up on the Freedom Riders like they did in Birmingham. <coughs> and uh, so anyway, for, uh, Claude got, uh, uh, it came to my attention when he walked in the office because he had gone to see Montgomery's, you know, most famous criminal lawyer, a man named John Blue Hill and John Harris. They're very fine lawyers. and. They had quoted him a price of uh, like ten thousand uh, dollars to represent him in this case, and the case was a federal charge, and it wasn't a criminal charge. It was a charge of interfering with the rights of uh, of people driving buses on the interstate, and uh, and they also sued the Montgomery police. Claude was a minor player. There were probably fifteen or twenty people. They sent John Doerr, one of their top prosecutors, down, Justice Department, Civil Rights Division, to handle this case, and it was before Judge Johnson. And, uh, and, they, and they had also a lot of Klan types, you know, that uh, was charged in this civil conspiracy. And all they were seeking was an injunction to enjoin them from interfering and trying to force the Montgomery police to protect these people in, in the future, I guess. And so Claude walked in my office. He said, I ain't got $10,000. He said, uh, you know, but he knew me from the country down there. And he said, well, look, would you, would you represent me? And I said, well, how much did Mr. Hill <laughs> offer you to charge you? He said, well, $10,000. I said, well, I'll take it for $5,000. <laughs> and so he's so glad. And so I go up to federal court. Uh, I, I didn't even know how to find the, you know, the, I knew what a building was, but I'd never been in there. Go in there, and I never forget it. It was a spectacle, you know. There was press everywhere and, and people all over the place. And, and there was a, a Calvin Weitzel was one of the lawyers. I think he was representing uh, maybe the police or, uh, or, and then there was people representing the Klan. There was some guy from Marietta, Marietta, Georgia, a lawyer named Venable or somebody like that. And he was over there and he had a briefcase, I remember, and he had like white power on the side of his briefcase. And this is James Venable. James Venable. That's Famous him. Klansman. Right. He was down there and a whole bunch of them was in there. And, it, you know, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they had, they had a Klan defendant, like the United Klans or somebody. I'm sitting in there, you know, looking and representing my client. Naturally, I want to be governor too, you know. I'm still having to get that up, you know. But, wasn't totally, but you know, in the back of my mind, and this thing is political, and you know, and all you know, lots of things going on, and I'm looking at that thing, and and so, then I'm thinking, you know, I don't, I don't feel too comfortable in here. I never will forget one. I can't the only black guy. He's kind of light skinned black guy, so and he was a well dressed, handsome guy, and as I was walking in the courtroom, he looked at me. I guess they were trying to make white folks feel bad. He said, uh, how, can, how, can you, how can you come down here and, and, and defend these people? And he didn't know who I was and nothing about me. But I, but I remember him saying that out in the hall as I was walking in the thing. And, uh, and he was, you know, he was just saying remarks like that. And I don't even know who he was. Could have been Andy Young, <laughs> who, who, who he was. And I'm going in there with Claude, and I'm sitting there, and, and uh, various witnesses get on the stand. And I remember putting some young black woman up there who was on the bus. And I remember Mr. Calvin Weiss were questioning her and asking her some yeah, rather questions like, I think, the, the, he, how much money did they give you when you uh, uh, left? She said, like, $5. He said, did they tell you not to spend it all in one place? You know, kind of a sarcastic thing. <coughs> and uh, in fact, I was kind of, you know, buying into that. 
And all of a sudden, I, I didn't feel comfortable a bit. And so I got up and, uh, and walked over to see this John Doerr fellow that's from Washington, D.C., and I said, uh, what do y'all want from Claude Henley? And they had a bunch of photographs of the FBI, and he showed me the amount. He said, well, we just, we just want an injunction against him. You know, I said, well, suppose I just say that we agree you can have an injunction against him. He'll say, well, then fine. If you agree to an injunction, that's it. So, man, we agreed to an injunction, and I was out of there. I stayed in that courtroom to my best of my knowledge. The record may show different, but I think I stayed in there one day. And that trial lasted a long time, and Judge Johnson ended up enjoining everybody. And all we did was stand up in front of Judge Johnson and say that we agreed to be enjoined. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go represent Claude as a criminal defendant down in Montgomery City Court. And I played him guilty. And they brought Mr. Kaika, uh, or I believe it was him, or someone nationally well-known me. They brought him all the way down here to testify against Claude to identify him. They could have just called me in advance because I played him guilty. And, uh, you know, they charged him like $100. Quite frankly, had I wanted to, probably could have got him off because then the judge of the court was, uh, at that time, was Judge Eugene D. Lowe. You're talking now in the, in the state court proceeding. In the, in the city court, yeah, Judge Lowe was the judge, and he was a close friend, and I'd seen him many times, people come down there, guilty as they could be, and you'd come up with some defense, you know, and then you could appeal it to a jury, and the jury probably wouldn't convict Claude, because he could he'd probably say the newsman threw something at him, or he thought he was gonna hit him with a camera, you know, all it took was just that, but uh, it, just my heart wasn't in it. It was that the first time you had met Judge Johnson in the court? First time I ever laid eyes on him was uh, in that court. And I can't, you know, uh, don't remember much too much about him. No, absolutely not. Uh, even though uh, Millard and I had, you know, constant uh, uh, debates and things about, about what we would, uh, what we felt about all this stuff because George Wallace, when I supported him in 58, he was not, you know, any, any kind of open, avowed racist, just quite the opposite. Uh, and he was a populist, and he, you know, he was our friend as a friend of Jim Folsom, and Jim Folsom was absolutely no racist. So when uh, Wallace ran the second time in 1962, uh, he decided he was going to take a racist view. And, uh, and I, you know, remained friends with George Wallace till he died, and, uh, but I never, ever supported him again. Uh, for any kind of political office. And I remember the day, he was inaugurated in 1962. Miller and I were so disgusted by the whole thing, we, we got our boat and uh, put it in the river, like you and I did, up around Tallahassee, and we floated down the, uh, the, the Tallapoosa River trying to find some ducks to shoot. And i never forget, it was cold. It was so cold when water hit the edge of the canoe, it just froze. And I, and I remember thinking, you know, that we talked about that. And that was kind of a a tipping point because back in college I had an opportunity to to face square on this whole issue of uh, of uh, rights of black people in 1955 when a judge in Birmingham Judge Grooms ordered the integration <coughs> of the University of Alabama a young woman named Arthurine Lucy and uh, and I was my first year in college and I remember the uh, professors told all of us to stay in the classroom don't go outside and she was going to be brought into the campus to, the, to, to register, to go over to the administration building. But I got out, I, I wanted to see, so I, I went and looked. And I remember it was about 10,000 people there on the square in the downtown uh, campus square area. And the, I remember a Greyhound bus came through because that was the main highway through town with no bypasses. <clears throat> and they rocked the bus trying to turn it over and, and they were shaking cars. And all of a sudden I saw Arthur and Lucy get out of a car and this priest and a couple of people walking her through the crowd, and they was throwing eggs and fruit and tomatoes, and I don't think they threw anything like rocks or bottles, but they were, they were definitely harassing her. And I remember when I watched this, I got up on the steps of the, of the, of the Union Building, which you could right, right at the corner where it, it, Tuscaloosa Avenue uh, across, I mean, uh, whatever the streets are, runs through the campus, go through there. Uh, and I just remember at the time seeing her and, uh, having a real sick feeling. First of all, to see a mob, an uncontrollable mob of thousands of people screaming and all that stuff. And then at the same time seeing this one little girl walking through the campus. And I remember uh, very definitely having strong feelings about that. <laughs> Going back to my little Baptist Sunday school class where I was superintendent of Sunday school mm -hmm. and talking about it the next Sunday. 
and, uh, and, and then being relieved of my job as Sunday school superintendent by the preacher of Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> Now, you know, you yeah. say, Morris, you had these feelings, but you also yeah. say that you and Millard were definitely not involved in no. civil rights activities. No, 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 definitely wasn't. In, in was there, did it come, did, did a point <laughs> come when you uh, uh, decided to get more involved? Uh, it's a gradual kind of thing. I do remember that at the University of Alabama, uh, and this was 1955 uh, uh, or six. Uh, there was this big thing about Emmett Till being uh, lynched over Mississippi, and there was a whole story about that. And I remember writing a letter to the editor, and I tried to find it subsequently and without success. It was either Tuscaloosa News or the Birmingham News, but I remember exactly what I wrote, saying that, you know, we might believe in segregation, but we also believe in justice. I think that something to that effect, and I said that, you know, he might be guilty of something, but we shouldn't have, we shouldn't lynch somebody and kill them. Let's have a trial and see what they're guilty of. And that's a kind of a hedging letter, so to speak, you know. But that's what I wrote. But it was basically saying that we didn't believe in, in, in <coughs> killing people like that. And I remember getting, uh, uh, and I put my address down there uh, on Deering Place, a little place I had an apartment when I got there. And I remember getting a letter in the mail, several of them, in fact, people writing the letter, put your name and address under the thing. And I got one from the Ku Klux Klan and said, you know, uh, nigger lover or something like that. And then I got a woman, a one from a lady with some Bible verses in it saying that blacks were intended to be subservient and that, that I was misguided and that she was going to be praying for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when you stopped practice, when you uh, <clears throat> went into business full time in, uh, in the early 60s, did you continue practicing law at all? I, I always did. I never, I never quit practicing law from the day I got out of law school, even though I didn't have an active law practice. I always had a case going of one type or another, uh, even though uh, we ran the business and, uh, and Miller was prim the primary manager of the business, uh, I practiced law right out of my business. What was the uh, first case that you would consider a civil rights case that you had? I can't remember the first case, but I, I, uh, some of the very early cases I had was ACLU connected. I remember one of the first major cases I had before Judge Johnson was the case trying to stop the building of Alabama State University in Montgomery because Montgomery already had a four-year college and they wanted to put Auburn University here. And Fred Gray uh, uh, had uh, been my guest to drive him to Tuscaloosa to give him the uh, ACLU's award. I was very active in the ACLU. And when uh, 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 driving back, he told me that he had this case <coughs> that uh, would I help him with it? And, uh, he, and the case was involved trying to prove that uh, they were perpetuating the dual school system by building Auburn and Montgomery. And when uh, uh, he hadn't done any work on the case much, of some lawyer from the Ink Fund handling it. That's the NAACP, NAACP, LDF in New York. Right. And so when, uh, so I said, well, I'd be glad to help you with it. And, uh, and, I, and this is probably, I don't remember the date of 1966 maybe something like that. Uh, and so I, uh, I prepared the factual background, proving that Auburn had gone to 40 or 50 white schools to see if students would come to Auburn if they put a campus in Montgomery, but they had failed to go to 40 or 50 predominantly black schools. Predominantly means all black schools. And we put this evidence on before Judge Johnson, and, and it was a three-judge court. He was sitting up there with two other judges. And when uh, uh, they ruled against us in the end, uh, I think primarily because, I don't think that would be the ruling today, but they ruled against us then because they said Alabama had the right to build all the schools they wanted to, but they couldn't operate them on a segregated basis. Well, you know, it turned out later there's big litigation over that, and they essentially have uh, merged a lot of facilities and programs, and, you know, the whole thing changed. But that was my first case, and to me, you know, it was uh, like any other case. The federal court was a whole, a whole lot different. I mean, I, I put a bunch of school principals up there and questioned them, and, uh, I put uh, Holman Head up there, who was, who was, I think he worked for the Alabama Montgomery Chamber of Commerce and proved that when they did a survey of the schools in Montgomery, in the area, the colleges, other competing colleges, they talked about Huntington and they talked about uh, uh, Alabama Christian College, I think, and Troy State, and how many the distances and all this, and whether it's viable to consider a college. They didn't even have Alabama State listed, mm -hmm. nor Tuskegee. You know, we proved a solid case, and I think, you know, and, uh, but. You know, it, was, and it wasn't that complicated. 
so that was it. But my actual first case I filed in court, uh, in, uh, civil rights in, case, you that mean? I remember filing in court, uh, was when I represented a uh, uh, a student at, uh, at Troy State University that was the editor of the newspaper, the Tripolitan, and he had written an article critical of of uh, George Wallace. I think there was a, an article dealing with some educational issue. It wasn't a racial issue. And George Wallace, his college friend and roommate, Dr. Ralph Adams, was president of Troy State. So, uh, so when uh, the faculty advisor saw this article, he told this young <coughs> editor, Gary Dickey, that he couldn't put that story in the newspaper. And, uh, and so Dickey, a uh, Vietnam veteran, returning, decorated and all that, uh, you know, he, he was offended. And so the paper was printed down in Enterprise, Alabama, at some local newspaper shop. And so he goes down there, and oh, in the space where the newspaper, where the editorial was supposed to be, he wrote the word censored right across it. And they had given him some stock editorial they sent to college newspapers to run in his place. And, and so Dickey that night takes the, the front page of the newspaper, the editorial page, where it said censored, brings it up to the Montgomery Advertiser. Well, the next morning it was on the front page of the Montgomery Advertiser, censored. <laughs> You know, and that boy, they kicked Dickie out of school. So I go before I file a lawsuit, and I'll have to tell you, I didn't study federal procedure in college, uh, in law school. You know, I just, I, don't, I guess they offered it, but you know, I just wanted to be an Alabama lawyer, you <laughs> know, criminal lawyer, and I didn't think about federal court for anything. And so I remember getting ready to file that suit, and, uh, and I called up, I, I, I went up to the court, and I said, could y'all give me some complaints up here, you know, that, it's telling me, well, how am I supposed to draw up a complaint here? And, and the clerk of the court uh, pulled out a few civil rights complaints and Xeroxed them for me, and I didn't even know anything about jurisdictional statutes or anything. I copied stuff, and I didn't even know you look it up see what it meant. And I called the ACLU, and they, you know, they had to mail me something because they didn't have faxes or nothing. So they got me one down here, and I put it together, filed a lawsuit, and, uh, and we had a big trial. And it was a it was a, it was a long trial, because uh, some Montgomery's big lawyers, Russian, Stakely, and Johnson or something, uh, Jimmy Garrett and all, they represented Troy State. What and, relief were you seeking? And I was seeking the <coughs> relief to uh, have this student reinstated. Uh, that's that's all I did. And uh, and Judge Johnson had better clerks than uh, than I was a lawyer. And some of these clerks, uh, I assume, got the right law and all. But fortunately, I never forget. Uh, Judge Johnson uh, treated me just like he would these old lawyers, you know, in court. And, uh, and I had known him a little bit, you know, uh, otherwise through the Unitarian Fellowship in town. He and his wife came occasionally, so he knew who I was. But I remember the ACLU sent me some recent case. It was a very important up-to-date case. And, uh, and it was, was going to be the deciding case on the issue. And, uh, and Mr. Garrett had not read the case. And so Judge Johnson said... Uh, Oh, Mr. Garrett, before we start this, uh, would you tell me, uh, how can you distinguish what happened in this case? And he hadn't heard, Judge Johnson hadn't heard any evidence. I, let me sorry, but how would Judge Johnson have said that, Morris? How well, would he have said it? He uh, uh, kind of looked like my, uh, my uncle that ran that country store. This is the way his face looked, but he was obviously not the same guy. <laughs> but he, uh, that I could see my uncle sitting up there, and he said, uh, oh, Mr. Garrett, uh, uh, Mr. Dees has cited the case of such and such and such, and, uh, and I think it uh, got a lot of bearing on the outcome of your litigation here. If we take what he says in his complaint to be the truth, and uh, well, how, what have you got to say about that? How can you distinguish that? And Mr. Garrett says, well, uh, you know, it's uh, different. Uh, it's on the fact. Uh, uh. <laughs> and, uh, and Judge Johnson said, uh, Mr. Garrett, have you read the case? And he said, well, well Judge, I've, uh, we, we, we've got it in our you know, advance sheets, but uh, I, I need a little time to, to study it. Judge Johnson says, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just recess and, uh, and give you a chance to read the case. So he gets off the bench and runs back in the back, and a few minutes later, the law clerk comes out with the case and gives it to Garrett. Garrett sits over and reads the case, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, I mean, I've won this thing. <laughs> I mean, it's Ooh, I'm so glad the ACLU sent me that case. <laughs> so uh, anyway, after it was over, Judge Mr. Garrett stood up, and as a good lawyer he was, he was a wonderful lawyer, he distinguished it. He tried to. He didn't distinguish it, but he tried to. He said, it does, you know, he had the differences and this and that. 
And Judge Johnson said, okay, let's have the first witness. So on we went. But it's, but Judge, during those days, they practiced law like I really love to practice law, as you know. Trial by ambush? Trial by ambush. <laughs> I mean, you've tried enough cases to me, Richard, over the last 14 years, is that it? 14 years to know that I don't really believe in discovery uh, because I'm not going to do all the work on a case. And the other side does nothing, and I get out and, and find these witnesses and then tell the other side in advance the witnesses because all they're going to do is make up some story. Well, back then, it was total trial by ambush. Today, when you go to federal court, it's no fun to practice because it's all paperwork. You know, they just, all this, uh, you know, you've got to give them this, give them this, give them this, you know, and, 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 and all that stuff. And uh, I guess it works for some of these big corporate lawyers and complicated cases. But back then, I had smoking guns, you know, and, and the other side didn't know about it. And so when they put them on the stand in the Dickey case or some of these other cases, the case against the YMCA, I mean, we had some, some smoking guns. I mean, you know, the head of the YMCA gets up there, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I just trap him, you know. I say, you do, 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 you know. And then he says, I don't never heard anything about that. Well, well, what do you think about this document right here you signed, you know, setting up the secret YMCA City of Montgomery Coordinating Agreement that says that the city can't run segregated parks, it'll do them with the YMCA. Blah. <laughs> you know, and I found, the, found such a document by pure accident. But, you know, I, so it was fun practicing, practicing in state and federal court then. Uh, you what did Judge Johnson wear in those days, Morris, on the bench? He didn't have but one thing. Um, he and I dressed exactly alike. We just wear the same suit. He went down and he bought them from the same place I bought them from. He was black. And all he bought was black. So he, he, didn't have, he told me that he didn't have to worry about what color shirt to wear with it or what color tie. It was just black. He only way he wore a robe because he had, you know, had a robe on top of it. But... He, but he had the same old black suit. We had the same salesman that sold them to us.
Uh, did you have any cases that uh, other cases that related, or any cases that related to the the, uh, the Vietnam War? Yes, I had uh, several cases, and one critical case I think that uh, the federal district court in Montgomery was involved in, and uh, uh, as I was I was closely associated with the ACLU, and uh, a group of students at Auburn, the student body, had invited William Sloan Coffin. Dr. Coffin was the chaplain of, of Yale University, and he was a very outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. Uh, this must have been about 1966 or so, 65, and somewhere in the early 60s, and uh, the war was just getting started, and I guess the two most unpopular things in America then was the Vietnam War and those people that opposed it. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the, and I never forget a country song. Uh, uh, this guy, he said, uh, you know, if you're putting down my country harsh, you're, you're walking on the fighting side of me. You know, that was all about the Vietnam War. I think it was Waylon Jennings and one of them that sung that song. And so, you know, it was, it was a very divisive issue. And so, uh, William Sloan Coughlin's going to come to Auburn. Well, George Wallace got a hold of it. And, uh, and he was, I believe, the governor, and he got a hold of it. He, and he told uh, Dr. Philpott, the president of Auburn University, to make sure that the student body canceled this speech. So Dr. Philpott, at the direction of Governor Wallace, and people in the legislature said they were not going to have this communist uh, William Sloan Coffin coming down here speaking to students because there'd be a riot. I mean, there'd bound to be a riot, and they'd burn half of Auburn down because they had stuff going on all over the country. You know, it's the campuses were rioting and everything. But this is, the, you know, uh, the plains, Auburn, you know, the past the real Cal College kind of place. And, and so, anyway, the students came to see me and asked me would I, would I represent them. I filed a suit in federal court, like a, I, wanna, I would guess it's a few days before he was supposed to speak, like a, they, they didn't let him know until about a week before they're going to cancel it. And uh, I remember talking to uh, Mr. Coffin, and uh, you know, to, to see, you know, could he help me give me any ideas on the lawsuit? And he really didn't have any ideas, so I filed the lawsuit in federal court, uh, asking uh, the, the court to enjoin. Uh, the university and required them to let him speak because it violated the First Amendment rights of the students. This case was Brooks versus uh, Auburn University. Brooks was the president of the student body. And <clears throat> so when uh, we went to court, uh, uh, we, we put on our, our evidence, uh, uh, and I honestly cannot tell you how much it was, but Judge Johnson gave us expedited everything because we were asking for a, <clears throat> a temporary restraining order, which was basically going to resolve the case. Uh, and Judge Johnson heard the case uh, and, and ruled promptly, I mean like in no time, that, uh, that uh, he would be allowed to speak, enjoin anybody from interfering with him, and required the, uh, the police to protect him and all that kind of stuff. And I remember uh, it, it, all it did was increase the crowd. I think there was like pack, they packed the gymnasium. There was not one single protest at all. Uh, and I remember William Sloan Coffin came to my house and, uh, and, and spent the night with me the night, came from Auburn, stayed at the house. We became friends after that. Uh, we had a lot of security around the house because I began to get threats about this whole thing. And about a day or two after he'd spoken, uh, I had a company out on the Atlanta Highway, a very large building, a couple hundred thousand square feet of space, and, uh, and we was building a new addition on the side of it, and somebody broke in the through the construction barriers, got in there and slashed KKK in the plaster walls along there and, and turned the water hose on and it flooded the basement where our computers were and did some damage to our computers. And uh, so uh, we, had, you know, we had police watching the building and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm thinking, you know, I didn't bargain for this. I mean, <laughs> I represent AZLU, nobody ever threatened me for anything. And I'm, you know, so I, I decided I'd better go see Judge Johnson, and maybe, you know, I'm a federal court, they call you an officer of the court or a lawyer, so I'd go up to see Judge Johnson and ask him, you know, could the court give me some help, could the FBI, because the city police that we had hired to watch our building had seen some cars and gotten some tag numbers, so maybe we could get a little help to, to get some protection. So I got my personal attorney, Leon Capuano, and we go up to see Judge Johnson, and he, he polite and met us in his chambers. And, we explained the whole thing to him, and I said, Judge Johnson, you know, I, it's because I brought this case in this court that, I, that this happened. So he, he went back there, and we gave him the names of the people that we got the tag numbers, and he got a little piece of paper out of his desk, and actually got a file out, and he started looking through it to see if he saw names, because he must have had clan names on his list. So he showed me the, 
list, and we, I mean, he didn't show me his list. I showed him my list, and he couldn't find any comparisons except for one guy uh, who lived out here in Chisholm. He saw his name on there, and he said, well, I want to tell you something. There's nothing we can do to help you. He said, you know, and he showed me a cartoon on his desk, and I, I can't exactly remember what it was. Some of his clerks might be able to remember it. We stood under the glass of his desk. He carried me around there and pushed his old chair back, and we looked at it. Leon and I did, and the bottom line was he said, if you can't stand the heat, you have to get out of the kitchen. That's what he told me. And the bottom line was, if I was going to do these kind of cases, and I was going to get threats, and if I was too timid to stand up against them, then I better quit. I remember that lesson. Now, you mentioned the YMCA case before, Morris. Um, now what year was that filed? <clears throat> I think I filed the YMCA case in about 1967, uh, uh, 67 or 68. You, did you still have your business at that time? Oh, yes. Yes. <coughs> I, I sold my business. Uh, I actually, actually consummated sale in January 1970. Okay. And um, briefly, if you would, describe kind of what the basis of the case was. What were you trying to do in that case? <coughs> in 1955, uh, right after Brown versus Board, suits being filed all over America challenging equal protection in city services, not just in school, but buses and everything. And uh, Fred Gray and lawyers from the Legal Defense Fund of the NACP filed a suit to integrate the parks in Montgomery, Alabama, Gilmore versus Montgomery. Uh, Mr. Gilmore, who later became a city council member, uh, his mother uh, filed a suit on his behalf because Oak Park, a very large park in Montgomery, uh, had black people living ex up against the back side of it and whites on the other side. It was kind of a separating thing. If blacks walked through that park, that was no problem whatsoever over the years until this, you know, issue came up about segregation. I knew that park very well. Uh, they had a swimming pool there, and I, we'd have our family pools there, but no black person ever thought about swimming at a swimming pool. Uh, you get a little 10 cent ticket in, in the city pool and we'd swim there and I remember you know, the first swimming pool I've ever been in. And Montgomery had about 15 or 20 parks and a large number of them had swimming pools in them. They were little small wading pools for kids and that kind of thing. Well, when that suit was filed, the city's response was <coughs> to close the parks. They put a chain link fence around <coughs> the Oak Park and they bulldoze your dirt into the swimming pool and close it up and close all the pool parks up in Montgomery and everything. And that was the end, end of it. Uh, in 1967, which is, you know, about six years, a few years, many years later, uh, a, a, a black lady uh, got in touch with uh, uh, a minister in Montgomery. I'm not sure who the man was. And that ended up getting, he brought it to my attention. Uh, I think his name was Schultz or somebody like that. He brought it to my attention that this black lady wanted to send, Mary Louise Smith wanted to send her two children to uh, the YMCA summer camp. She'd given, been given some money. She was a maid, I believe, at the Holiday Inn. And so uh, I told her, I said, well, you know, uh, why don't you go down to the central YMCA, the central branch of the, y, of the YMCA at the time, and uh, she said, well, you think they'll let us go. She actually came to me, it's not so much as a legal matter, she wanted me to actually get her kids in camp somewhere. Because they have a black YMCA called Cleveland Branch YMCA, now Rosa Parks Avenue, and, uh, and they had no parks or pools. And so I knew, because I was very involved in the YMCA, I knew exactly that they didn't have any, any place for black kids. And so uh, she came back and she said, well, Mr. Chandler, who was head of the Y, said that, you know, he was sorry, but they had no parks. And, no, no camp for black children. And so I filed a lawsuit for Mary Louise Smith and her sister against the YMCA uh, to, to uh, actually to integrate the Y. Now what you have to realize is at the time of the closing of the parks, Montgomery had one branch of the YMCA and it was on the same street our building is on today, Washington Avenue, down near the courthouse and it had like uh, 300 members and it was basically where <coughs> white male, older mid businessmen went in doing, you know, for rub downs and all that kind of stuff and they had some high Y programs, YMCA programs in the schools and they did have this camp. They call it uh, Camp Belzer. It was a camp up in uh, up, up in Wetumpka on Lake Martin. 
And so, uh, but over the ensuing years, they ended up with branches of the Y everywhere. They had like 15 or 20,000 members by the 19, 19, uh, 1967 when I brought this lawsuit. They had, all these branches had swimming pools. Many of them were tied very closely to junior high schools in Montgomery, predominantly white. They even had a branch over in uh, 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 Wetumpka, uh, Prattville, and, the, and they had a, a citywide board of directors, and the mayor of Montgomery was ex officio chairman of the board of directors of the YMCA. So I filed a lawsuit uh, on the basis that the YMCA uh, used city <coughs> services, like getting the city to fill its swimming pools that had a tax-exempt status. When I filed the lawsuit, honestly, it was on a hope and a prayer. I really didn't have any idea of what the evidence would ultimately show in the end. Uh, I had read Marsh versus Alabama, a famous old U.S. Supreme Court case where the company owned a town in Pritchett, Alabama, and, uh, and, they, and they wouldn't let some seven-day Adventists or somebody pass out pamphlets. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, look, if you, if you set up a town, even though you're not a, a, a really a state town, it's a company town, you've got to follow the dictates of the, of the Constitution of the United States, and you can't deny people free speech. It's the only access they got to these people. Well. And also, I had another tiny little chip off. Uh, Judge Johnson uh, uh, was in our Unitarian Fellowship, and we had various parties, and there was a, a labor organizer named Earl Pippin, who was a very liberal guy, and he lived in the old Cloverdale area. And I remember one night at, uh, at Earl Pippin's house, and Judge Johnson was sitting there, and, and uh, Judge Johnson didn't know that I had talked to the Smith <laughs> ladies or anything like that, and I'm sitting there thinking, what am I going to do with this case? I mean, it was about a month after this lady got there before I figured to file a lawsuit because I didn't think about prayer. There were very few lawsuits around where you sue totally private organizations. Anyway, so I said, well, what could you do with something like the YMCA? And Judge Johnson was sitting over there drinking a whiskey or something, and he said, uh, well, I think it's usurpation of a city function. So... I went and looked up use of patient, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and uh, you know, talked to a few people and we drafted up this complaint and filed it. And uh and in the ensuing lawsuit it was uh, I take it this case ended up in front of Judge Johnson. Judge, Judge Johnson. The, the only uh, federal he was judge. The only federal judge in Montgomery. And I have to tell you a lot of my successes are because of Judge Johnson, not because of me. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you. And uh, you know, the uh, I got a lot, we can say a lot about that a long down the road, but Judge Johnson he, it was a wonderful time to practice in this general area. In, before Judge Johnson and some of the state judges too at the time. But we put on a very lengthy case. And the case lasted about a year and a month or two before he finally ruled. And we put on some devastating evidence against the YMCA. Uh, he, they were represented by Rod Nachman and Oakley Melton, former president of the Alabama Bar, both very fine and qualified lawyers. They represented the YMCA free. My first deposition, I subpoenaed all the YMCA minutes and all that kind of stuff out to my company. They brought it out there, you know, into the, my business. <coughs> and uh, uh, and I, Mr. Renat was a skilled lawyer, as I say, and he, he uh, uh, I remember I'm, I'm sitting there looking through the documents. He says, let the record show it's 5-0, it's uh, 10 minutes after 2, and I'm looking, let the record show it's 10. I said, I'll tell you what y'all do. Uh, do y'all just let me look through these files y'all brought out here? Uh, why y'all go to lunch or something? Well, I don't want to take time to deposition because I was de deposing Mr. Chandler, and I was also saying they was operating like uh, you know uh, they had the Civil Rights Act passed, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and maybe this was public accommodation, you know, and they had to prove maybe people didn't sleep in the Y, they did, they didn't have that kind of thing, but you know had a lot of theories, but you know nothing really good, and uh, and so when they left the room, I started looking through this stuff, and uh, and I found in there a. Uh, a document that was uh, in a file that did, did uh, from other stuff. It was like a minutes file, some some minutes, but it was a YMCA Montgomery coordinating athletic agreement with the city of Montgomery. And I looked at it for a few minutes, and I said, "Oh my God!" I mean, basically, it divided up the, the recreational function between the city and the Y. And one thing it said was, the city will not compete with the YMCA in youth football. Uh, swimming, several things. So I ran back to my copy machine and made a copy of it, put the thing back in the file, and didn't say a word about it. 
back then, you know, you didn't have to give the other side all the exhibits you intended to use. You'd have to exchange exhibits and all that stuff. And uh, so I put the thing back in there and deposition, you know, and I, you know, I also at the same time made copies of all their minutes. And the, the crowning moment in the case was that, you know, bringing, having Mr. Chandler on the stand. He's a very fine guy, and he was doing what he thought was best for the city and the YMCA program at the time. But when he was hit with that YMCA coordinating agreement, I mean, that was the YMCA taking over city function. And I think, and the, kind of the sad, the legacy of that case was that Montgomery had a fine parks program. Uh, and there were a lot of, and once these places were closed, every city agency went after the land that those parks was on. Montgomery had probably better <laughs> parks program than any city in the country. Uh, one wonderful park was Yancey Park over in Capitol Heights. I used, to, I used to go and swim as a little boy when I came to visit a city friend. And uh, some rehabilitation program took it over. The entire thing was gone forever. And the, the police department in Montgomery now sits on a fine park. That was a park. They need a place for a police station and all that. That takes over a park. And, oh, and then I, so I had an investigator go and check the, the 1930s newspapers in Montgomery, 40s, when I used to come to town in the 40s. And because we'd always watch the newspaper to see when they opened the pools, because always swam in creeks in the river in the country, and there was something to swim in a pool. So we'd always want to come to town and visit our friend cause when they put water in pools. And so I, so I got the old <coughs> Montgomery advertisers, and darn if they didn't list every single park. There's like 20 something of them in Montgomery. And so I had our investigator run around, you know, and me, me the investigator, most of them taking pictures. Huh? And that was one park that uh, I couldn't find. And, and it was a park, I think it was called the Dasa Park. And so I, I said, where's this thing? So we went back and, and we found it in the newspaper and they listed its address on Perry Street. And we drove all up and down Perry Street and the interstate had come through. I figured the interstate might have taken over this park. We cut through Perry Street. And so finally we, we found, you know, uh, talking to people. Well, it turns out that the Central YMCA branch was sitting on Kiwanis Park, I mean, Hadassah Park. And these Jewish women in Montgomery had bought this land and used it as a TB sanatorium. And when the TB kind of faded out of the disease, they gave it to the city with the idea that it had to be used for public recreation. And the city then sold it to the YMCA for the grand sum of $100 with the condition that it would always be used for recreation. So here was the main headquarters of the city recreation program, the Central YMCA, on land that was operated by the city under an agreement that it had to be used for se segregated, quote, recreation. So, you know, it was a pretty dramatic case. And in the end, Judge Johnson not only ordered uh, the desegregation of all the YMCAs, but he began to sign schools to YMCAs for the very school <coughs> programs, which meant the Y was thoroughly segregated, and gave the plaintiffs, us, control over the YMCA's expansion programs for, you know, Years. You mean thoroughly integrated the thoroughly what? integrated. I'm sorry, thoroughly yes. integrated. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, but it, but it, that didn't last long. Our oversight didn't last any time. Uh, I was very familiar with the YMCA and the programs, and I've been a contributor. And it's the first time they came to see us, you know, saying they wanted to sell the Southeast Y because for some reason it wasn't economically feasible and all that kind of stuff. I just asked uh, Mr. Chandler. I said, "Is that the best thing for the Y?" The best thing he said, "Yep, yep, yep," and you know. So I went down to Judge Johnson and filed a motion ending our supervision of the YMCA's programs. And uh, Mr. Chandler over the years has, has you know, uh, been very praiseworthy of the lawsuit. He said that had we not filed the lawsuit and had Judge Johnson not ruled like he did, then things wouldn't have moved on as quick. And he felt that it took the lawsuit to do things that he couldn't do himself. Now this, uh, the, the lawsuit against the YMCA, uh, given its close association with the city and given uh, the prominent <coughs> people uh, who were behind it, uh, was, um, I take it a bit like sticking uh, a stick in someone's eye, the eye of the Montgomery community. Would mm -hmm. you say so? I, I would say that uh, probably in this whole area of integration, the, 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 uh, the thing used by the Klan, and it's used by the neo-Nazis even today and the, even the racists of today, is racial mixing. And the worst taboo is interracial relationships. And, and when they close that pool because they didn't want little white girls in the pool with little black boys because they saw that led to, you know, interracial marriages and dating, et cetera. And that's still a feeling that exists a lot in Alabama today. Many, many 
white, predominant white boxes in the most recent election in the year 2000 uh, voted against the, uh, the constitutional, uh, removing the constitutional ban on interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, it was a thing that, uh, that they just didn't want these kids all black and white mixing together. It was a, it was a thing to use by the Klan to stir up white people. Uh, and, 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 you know, and it was a thing that I think they feared more than anything, which caused enormous bitterness towards me personally. You suffer, you or your family suffer any retaliation as a result of this? Uh, some ostr being ostracized, I'm sure, but, you know, living way out in the country like I did and uh, uh, being, you know, and, and having had a little taste of it before when I filed the case against uh, uh, Auburn to get Dr. Coffin to come speak. One of my neighbors, who has always been a friend, I used to spend the night with him when I was growing up. Uh, he, he came up to me in the store and he says, "Look, if you don't like the United States, you can just leave the country. I'm representing William Sloan Coffin. <laughs> you know, you just represent me, communist. You know. Anyway, so I'd had a little bit of that, you know, and then you know, and I I had that feeling, and I and I and my first really step out in the civil rights movement was in 1965 and the voting rights. March from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, Millard Fuller and I uh, carried people to Selma in our cars to get in the march. You know, we would meet them in Montgomery at the airport, and some of them stayed at Millard's house in town. Mm -hmm. And then these were ministers coming from up north mainly, and we'd take them over in our car. And, and, uh, and the state troopers filmed everything coming into Selma. You had to go on one road, you know. And I remember out there in front of Rounds Chapel Church, and there's thousands of people there. This is the sun, you know, they had already beaten up the people at the bridge. This is going to be the big march. And I'm standing out there with all these people, and, and, uh, and somebody said, let's pray. And they will forget that everybody got out on the ground on their knees, and, you know, I wasn't getting out on my ground on the knees, you know. <laughs> you know, just wasn't into the praying thing. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and on top of these vans, there were these cameras, and they were, you know, police-type people, taking pictures of everybody. I dropped down on my knees. And, uh, but they told my mama that I was involved in, uh, in hauling those, quote, niggas, and I uh, wanted to know why Bubba was tied up with the communists. And the sheriff of Montgomery County delivered the message to my mother to try to intimidate me, I guess. And that's 1965, Selma March. Why were you tied up with those communists? Well, I What made you decide to I file that YMCA lawsuit? What, what? Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, uh, it's kind of hard to say. I just think it was a lot of things coming together. Uh, I bought Miller out in 1965. Uh, we'd been, you know, uh, uh, very active in the background of the civil rights movement. Going to Selma was a first big major step. I walked down the street and watched Dr. King, you know, make his speech, uh, you know, down there uh, from 1965 March. And uh, but I wasn't totally and publicly out identified with that aspect of it, even though I filed some, some, you know, uh, at that time, 1965. I don't think I'd filed any civil rights cases, not to my knowledge. Uh, it just, it was just a gradual progression. You know, of deciding that uh, that I, you know, wanted to spend my time in my life doing uh, things that counted. When you sold your business in 1970, what you do? Uh, well, I had to stay in under a contract for five years, but uh, I quickly, you know, did not want to do that. So I uh, decided that I would tell, talk Times Mirror into giving me a leave of absence. And they were glad to give me a leave of absence because, you know, I don't think they ever understood what they purchased when they bought my company. And they brought in some high-powered executive to, to run it, you know, and he later ran it in the ground. But, uh, but you know, I was gone, and uh, so I bet you they had paid me a lot of money. So I uh, set up a small law practice uh, with a guy named Joe Levin in Montgomery and, uh, and, and then began to, to do civil rights cases uh, and regular regular. Uh, Law practicing law, mm -hmm. that that practice didn't last very long because I got very bored with uh, you know I had all the money I needed in the bank. I mean I, my, I had getting dividends of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in 1970 for my stock, and so I didn't need any money. I just law practice, and so I would uh, uh, in Levin you know whatever money we made he got the money, I gave it to him, and so I said well you know and I'd already given about a million dollars of money I got to set up a nonprofit group to fight for my real passion, and that's uh, uh, pro-choice issues, women's right to choice. And I set up a group in Washington, New York, called the James Madison Constitutional Law Institute to do that as well as uh, uh, to, uh, to work on poverty issues, law issues, and things like that. And I had this professor of Alabama named 
Professor Roy Lucas had, had uh, came, come down and, and watched me try a few cases, and particularly the, the, uh, the, the Gary Dickey case, uh, uh, the student case and, uh, and others, <coughs> and, he had written, and they were appealed to the Fifth Circuit, and he had helped me on some appeal briefs, so he proposed that he would run such a group, and I, so I gave the money to it. And, um, and I actually, and it was in New York, and, uh, and I really, and, and this was in 1969 and 70, I got 70, and so I, I saw that it wasn't going to work in New York, because I wanted to practice law, and up there in New York, and it was too expensive, and so I, I withdrew mm -hmm. half of the money I'd given him, and put it back, and set, and uh, put it back in my bank account, and just started practicing law down here. Mm -hmm. Kept a good relationship with people, they got funding from other sources, and uh, and then all of a sudden, I proposed to Joe. Well, I decided, to, well, how sudden it was, but to Joe Levin that, you know, I couldn't fund this stuff myself. I mean, I only got a limited amount of money. I didn't that much money, and and so and why didn't we try to see if we couldn't set up our own nonprofit group, and uh, and try to you know raise money by mail, writing people who gave to liberal progressive causes. So in 1971, we incorporated uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and we. And we folded our law practice into it. We gave it all its equipment, books, and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, you mentioned Joe Levin. Who was he? Uh, he was a young lawyer uh, who was a friend of my brother's, and his daddy was a commercial attorney in Montgomery doing business work. And Joe was extremely bored with his daddy's practice. He'd been in the military, come back to Montgomery, and uh, he told my brother if I ever got a case that he could work on with me. He had seen the YMCA case. and those kinds of things, and his, his interests lie more towards what I did, would uh, he be willing to, would I be willing to let him help me with a case? Mm -hmm. Well, that happened in 1969, <coughs> I think, uh, uh, early 70, when a, a, a state senator uh, was indicted for, for uh, attempted bribery in, uh, uh, in the Alabama legislature to get a bill through the legislature. And I, uh, I was asked by uh, Clifford Fulford, uh, later became a federal bankruptcy judge in Birmingham, and others if I wouldn't help this man uh, out because they thought he'd being railroaded. Uh, he was just a naive ex-Navy guy who lived in Wetumpka, and, and he had been sucked in by a lot of powerful politicians and to get in, in, uh, in this request for money. They didn't believe he, he was, had any evil intent. Uh, I had an airplane then, and so I flew him to uh, Atlanta to meet with F. Lee Bailey, famous criminal lawyer, and he, and he was very sympathetic with this man, but said he had to have a minimum of $25,000 to represent him to cover his cost. And that was like, you man, have $25,000. So he's very disheartened. He's five young kids, and he's fixing to go to trial in Montgomery. And the Montgomery newspaper advertiser was railroading him, and all the big paws that dumped on him, it turned out that he wasn't committed, you know, in the end, he, I got him acquitted. But, uh, but he, uh, he was the other people just using him, and when somebody found out about the scheme to get money, they dumped on him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I agreed to represent him, uh, you know, free. And uh, uh, I called Joe Levin, and, and, and he, I told him I have this other lawyer to help, and he would charge $5,000, and I would, do, I would do my part free. Mm -hmm. So for, for a month, Levin and I worked together uh, preparing for the trial. We tried it before Judge Richard Emmett in Montgomery. Mr. Croslin was the prosecutor. And it was a highly, highly uh, popular case for prosecutors and judges because uncovering, uncovering political corruption was a big thing. The Montgomery advertiser was helping them at every turn. And it turned out that they didn't do their homework on the facts. Senator McCarley was a fine man, and this bill was to get a police retirement fund set up. And he was actually trying to help the police. And when he was told he needed $5,000 to get this bill out of uh, Senator Cooper's committee, Senator Roland Cooper's committee, he, uh, uh, he's from Wilcox County, uh, Carly simply went to the police chief and said they need $5,000. And he said, I wouldn't pay them a dime. Y'all are trying to, you know. And the police chiefs all wanted the bill, so they said, yeah, we'll get the money up for you. But uh, unbeknownst to Mr. Cross and the prosecutor uh, and the advertiser who was pushing the case, Mr. McCarley and a couple of the police chiefs got together and decided they'd mark the money and they would get a tape recorder to record the transfer of the money to Mr. Cooper. Well, the story broke in the advertiser because word spread what was going on. They indicted McCarley and uh, the case was tried before Judge Emmett, uh, who saw himself becoming governor if he won this case, and Mr. Croson was going to run for judge. But they, they, wasn't, they wasn't prepared for the chief, Drew Lackey, the uh, police chief of Montgomery, to say that. Uh, 
that Mr. McCarley had told him he was supposed to pay him the money and they were going to mark the bills and they were going to have a tape recorder. And Melba Till Allen, the Secretary of State of Alabama, provided the tape recorder to tape the stuff because she had it for her investigator. I believe she was an auditor or some, one of those jobs up there for the state. And so the jury, uh, the jury acquitted McCarley, and that was kind of like the beginning of Joe Levin and, and my relationship. And what year again did you file the center? 1971, January of 71, we actually incorporated. And what was your original purpose in finding in founding the center? The original purpose of finding the law center was to uh, try to work on cases that where the law uh, uh, discriminated against a person based on their economics. And criminal law was really my passion, and so I was thinking about uh, funds for indigents to have investigators and uh, uh, the, the law, my thought, was moving in that direction. Uh, uh, Governor Warren of California had uh, been on the Supreme Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he was off in that. He got, I got off in 1972, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Warren Berger became Chief Justice. And we figured that they weren't going to have the activism of the, the Earl Warren Court, but at least how could they turn their back on, on inequality based on income issues? And there are a lot of issues that are involved in here. That's why we named the Southern Poverty Law Center. <coughs> It wasn't your typical poverty law kind of center. We didn't represent people who couldn't pay their rent and had complaints against their landlord. It was more of a class action kind of lawsuit. And death penalty was a, a critical issue that I had in mind. Uh, in fact, our first major case was a death penalty case. Now, how was the center funded? The center originally was, uh, uh, I guess you could say I funded it myself, you know, out of my money. Uh, but because uh, I went to the bank and, you know, put my name on the notes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, I didn't get paid to work there, and you know, and, I, and we gave it all of this, all of the, all of the uh, uh, equipment and everything that we had, law law firm equipment and books and everything. Uh, but uh, we started direct mail funding of it. Uh, I hired uh, from the even before we incorporated, <laughs> I found a, a very sharp direct mail person that had been brought to Montgomery to work for my company, for Times Mirror, the Los Angeles Times that purchased my company named Michael Fidlow, and I hired uh, a couple of more people that understood this whole direct mail business. And from the beginning, we set up a business division of the Law Center to make sure it was well-funded. And the, the first letter we sent out was to raise money for Jimmy Lee McLeod, a black man who this same Judge Emmett had, uh, had said was uh, probably guilty <coughs> when I filed a motion to have a, a bond hearing it shot a black guy, shot a white woman in a, in a burglar of her home, and he probably was guilty. But uh, And so I, I called up these lawyers that, around Montgomery to see who would help me. I wanted somebody to come down and, uh, and be an expert witness to say that, you know, that kind of statement was probably uh, prejudicial, and I wanted to change a venue. And so I called up uh, a number of them, and they didn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. and, and so Truman Hobbs, uh, you know, who had been a friend through liberal politics and all, I called him and he gave me an affidavit. And actually, he told me, he said he had a better way to handle it. And maybe that's different than me and Judge Hobbs, who's now Judge Hobbs, is that he's more diplomatic than I am. You know, I was wanting to get my affidavits and I wanted to have a little fight down in the courthouse, you know, because I wanted to get error in the record so that if we convicted this guy and appeal it, I'd get it reversed. But Judge Hobbs called up Judge Emmett, I know that's what happened. And uh, you know, telling him that he's fixing to have to come in on my half. <laughs> Besides, and Judge Emmett let us know, you know, that the, we'll, I'll transfer this case. He says, I don't think that I did anything wrong, but out of abundance or precaution, I'll transfer this case. Mm -hmm. so they transferred to Birmingham, and we got the guy, got the guy for uh, second degree murder or something like that. But in the meantime, we sent letters all over the country with a clipping from the Montgomery Advertiser uh, saying that Judge declares McLeod guilty. Headline. In the story, mail this thing out, and uh, and we picked a few names, ACLU contributors, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, people started responding, and we started. That's how we started our fundraising. I remember the first donor came in the mail. I looked at the check, written out Southern Poverty Law Center, like fifteen dollars from somebody in Teaneck, New Jersey, and they will forget. And and I felt just like I did when I was in college when I got that first birthday cake order. I went and got the uh, birthday cake order out, and it said, you know. Uh, payable to the Bama Birthday Cake Service, so it's no different. It's just uh, <coughs> selling the concept of justice. You mentioned the, uh, the, the ACLU mailing list. I know you later got a, uh, uh, a very valuable mailing list from, uh, uh, from George McGovern, is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, and what was your connection to Mr. McGovern? 
Well, uh, Fred Gray was a close friend, and I had done a, a number of cases with him, and I put he, he, his name was on the YMCA case, even though I did the work, and I filed the lawsuit. I felt that I needed lawyers, you know, who was connected, and I always wanted to be close to the black community and their lawyers, so I put his name on there. And, and then he called me one day and said that he was going to be running for the Alabama legislature. I think it was 1971 or so, 70 or 71. There was no blacks in the Alabama legislature. And, uh, and would, I, would I help him raise money? I said, sure. I think what we need to do, Fred, is go to Washington, D.C., and there's going to be a presidential election in 1972. And two years before, a lot of people said they wanted to run. Uh, one of them was Muskie and Humphrey, uh, Senator Humphrey and uh, Senator uh, Jackson and George McGovern and all those people. So I said, let's go up there. And so I, uh, I called ahead and, and tried to get appointments, and I couldn't get any appointments about it. I didn't know who I was and Fred Gray and nothing. So we flew to Washington and stayed in a hotel up on Capitol Hill, Fred and I, and, and we just went around to these offices, walked in McGovern's office, and Gary Hart was hanging around there. And he said, uh, uh, I tell you what, I'll get you, I'll talk to McGovern. And McGovern says, you fellas, come on, have lunch with me over in this Senate dining room. And to me, you know, I'd never been in the Capitol, and that was quite a thing, you know, and Fred Gray and I was sitting there, and they, and they served us this navy bean soup. That's their special up there. And, uh, and, I'm, and, and that was some Senator, you know, Talmadge over there, and Senator so-and-so and some, and they pointing them all out. And I felt, man, I'm big. <laughs> and so uh, George McGovern told Gary Hart, whispered something to him, he came back with a check for $1,000 for Fred Gray. And then uh, we went to all these other, we couldn't get in Jackson's or Humphreys or money. None of them would talk to us. Fred and I flew on back. And, uh, and so uh, I told McGovern at the time about my business, what I did, and all that kind of stuff. And, and then uh, uh, a short time later, Joe Levin and I filed a lawsuit called Chavez versus, there was a case called Chavez versus Whitcomb out of the U.S. Supreme Court trying to divide up the state of Indiana's single member districts. So I filed one called Nixon versus Brewer. E.D. Nixon was my client. Governor Brewer was the governor. And we was going to divide Alabama up into single member districts. And that was filed here in the middle district? Middle district, yeah. And so we filed the thing, and three judge court uh, ruled that, uh, you know, that sounded good what we had to say, single member districts, but they need to wait till the census came in. 1970, the census is over. They put us on hold. We ultimately got single member districts. But Levin and I fly to to uh, uh, up there to Indiana to meet the lawyer in Marion County, Indiana, to handle the Chavez versus Whitman case, see what he did wrong, because he lost it in the Supreme Court. Didn't get single member districts. And, and so he says, well, I'm the Marion County Democratic politi political chairman, and there's a guy named McGovern's coming to town to make a speech at breakfast. Would you go with me? Joe and I go over there. We stand in the back and listen to McGovern. After it's over, walk up and see McGovern. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're the guy that came in with Fred Gray. And so we chatted a little while, and uh, McGovern uh, uh, later called me up through one of his aides and asked me if I wouldn't help him with his campaign because I guess he thought I was a good fundraiser. I got $1,000 out of it. Uh, but he thought actually I ran a, a mail, a, a printing company that could print letters, and he wanted to send out an announcement for his campaign, denouncing his campaign like Benjamin Franklin or somebody did. And I convinced him to let us try to ask for money in the letters, and, uh, and he... Uh, I passed the idea around to some pretty astute political people, and they thought it would not work. It'd be a bad idea, but uh, I did it anyway. And uh, without and, McGovern's knowledge, and totally without his knowledge, <laughs> the letter that uh, William, the letter that John Kenneth Galbraith edited for him that I had, you know, worked on five, six-page long letter, and uh, and I had help, had some help from a friend of mine, a good copywriter, who wrote a nice letter, and all about McGovern and all about the war in Vietnam and. This is a letter on McGovern's signature, signature right? Signature, right. And, <coughs> I, and I uh, showed it to McGovern, and he sent it to Dick, Dick uh, Goodwin, who was a speechwriter for Kennedy, and he sent it to Mr. Garbutt, and they sent it back, and uh, they can't do this. And so actually I said, fine, and they ended up with some little one-page thing. My name's Jordan McGovern. I'm against the war. Send me money. And, and uh, there's nothing to it. So I, so I just I got my company. We had direct mail. We had a business. I knew all my contacts. So we, we mailed uh, about 300,000 letters out. And three hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand of the original, original letter, letter. Uh, on yeah. McGovern's signature, McGovern's without signature, his permission, without his permission, no knowledge, <laughs> no anything. And about like, uh, about like uh, a week after the letter was out, the return address was the Senate, U.S. Senate, which you couldn't probably do today, but in his own Senate stationery and all that stuff. And he got back, and his secretary called me up and said, Senator McGovern wants to see you. Ooh, 
she said, it's that letter you sent out. And I said, uh, it was a good typical direct mail letter. He ended with a quote from Ecclesiastes, you know, about beating the flashheads and the swords and the flashheads and all that kind of stuff. You explained to McGovern that it was just an innocent mistake, didn't you? I didn't talk to him. I told him, I said, I'm busy down here in Alabama, and uh, I wish I could come up there now, but you tell him I, I can't come for a week from now. But see, I wanted some results to get in. And uh, about a, two days later, I got a call from uh, his assistant, and she said, uh, since McGovern uh, wants to talk to you now. And I said, what's, what's it about? He says, well, this letter is bringing in so much money you wouldn't believe. And I said, okay, I'll talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, he called me, he said, Morris, talks like that to this day. He called me from Rome the other day. He's an ambassador over there for Clinton appointment. Morris, uh, you think you could come up here and... Uh, I think I got a major role in my campaign for you. I said, Senator, I'm come on up here. I went up and I talked to him and, uh, and he wanted to give me a major role, which I didn't want to take because I, I thought I did for a while, but then, then I, I just said, I'll just raise your money. He made me a finance chairman or, or camp fundraiser or something like that. And we ended up getting 600,000 people to give $24 million in small contributions in the mail by using the techniques that I pioneered in business and other people had, you know, mail that really worked. It mm -hmm. told a story that really told why you should give to mm -hmm. McGovern. We set him up a monthly giving club and, and that kind of stuff. And the first time a camp political campaign had ever been run by contributions from small donations and stuff. And uh, and when the camp McGovern obviously lost, but we did through the fundraising beat Humphrey, Muskie, and all these other people who had the nomination locked up. He was only 1% of the polls, and I went to work with him. And so, uh, and I had a little bit of antagonism towards the Vietnam War after representing Mr. Coffin, and what Mr. Gov McGovern was a leading opponent of the war, vilified at every turn, but got the nomination. And the country was severely divided at the time. And uh, so when the campaign was over, uh, we ended up, had no debts, even gave people back money large contributors who loaned us and paid everybody back, you know. And, uh, and I said to Mr. McGovern, you know, would you uh, allow me to use this mailing list, the 600,000 names? They were the best progressive liberals in the country. And so he said, uh, I'll do better than that. I'll write a letter for you. So I drafted a letter for him to sign, and he told the story about this guy from Alabama who had stopped everything he was doing and had come to Washington to help me. And I've had the Alabama State Trooper case in the meantime integrating the Alabama State Troopers. And I was here in the Middle District Middle as well. Middle District, right. And, uh, in front of Judge Johnson? In front, front of Judge Johnson, and we'd got a hiring ratio of one for one, and it got national news. It was on the New York Times and NBC and all the stations, and it was, you know, Judge Johnson's state troopers that just beat up the, I mean, uh, pardon me, uh, Wallace's state troopers that just beat up the marches at the Selma Bridge. And so it was a highly popular case, and McGovern could see that, well, this lawyer is involved in something here, you know, other than just small-time Alabama cases. And so he wrote the letter. And, uh, and the center at that point probably had 10,000 donors, maybe at the max. But the response from that McGovern mailing was overwhelming. And, uh, and we mailed it like seven, eight, or 10 times over and over and over and over, free. It didn't cost anything to mail it. You have to rent mailing lists, but he gave it to us free over and over and over. And, uh, and so that, that gave us a solid fund rate, a solid base. And it wasn't long before we were beginning to build a lasting endowment. We, you know, we, we spread our work out. and. Uh, and today, thanks to McGovern, we have 550,000 supporters in the country, active supporters today, contributors. And probably since that time, we've probably had probably 3 million supporters. They don't always stay, you know, they come and go. But there have probably been at least 3 million different people who've contributed to the center since its founding in 1971. Before uh, we talk about some of the center's early cases, uh, uh, let me just ask you, Morris, uh, you, you that, the McGovern fundraising wasn't your only fundraising work in the political arena, was it? Not in the long run. Uh, the, the, uh, Tell us briefly about well, some because, of those others. Because, I think it would be interesting to yeah, people. Certainly, because uh, of, of the uh, publicity that I received, and you know, in the political circles are small, people know who does what. Uh, I got uh, a lot of requests for the next presidential campaign because everybody thought the direct mail was a panacea, and Nixon had abused. Uh, unlimited campaign contributions, and Congress passed the campaign spending law uh, saying that you can only give $1,000 a person, so small donations became, people thought, 
the way to go. There was no such thing as soft money then. It was just really limited. And there was federal financing of the general election, but not in the primaries. And, uh, and I knew Jimmy Carter from other things. Uh, in the JCs, I'd met him. Uh, I, I, I was a judge with him for the, selecting the four outstanding young men of Georgia before he was governor of Georgia. And uh, I think he may have been a senator or something at the time. And so when uh, he contacted me and asked me would I help him in his campaign, and uh, Hamilton Jordan came over and visited with me, and I didn't really want to get involved, and I uh, had enough of it. But uh, he, they persisted, and when the real issue came, the, 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 the showdown in Florida against George Wallace, uh, against uh, Jimmy Carter, and if Jimmy Carter could beat Wallace in Florida, then he would have gotten rid of one of the problems the Democratic Party faced, George Wallace, and he would also show that he could win. So before the Florida election, they needed a million dollars uh, to, to really fund that properly. And George Wallace had Bill France, the founder of, and, and very popular head of the uh, uh, Daytona Speedway as his Florida chairman, and he looked good. He had the North Florida kind of white vote, race, more racially motivated vote. So it, it, was, a, it was a close race. And, uh, and so I went over to, uh, to help Jimmy Carter in, uh, in using direct mail again and telephones this time. We got in touch with the people who had given him money in the past, he'd raised a couple of million dollars from around the country, not a lot. We call all those people and ask them to give what they'd given before. You know, we enlisted stockbrokers and lawyers from law firms, and we had every major law firm in Atlanta, every telephone they had at night going away, calling all these people on the phone, writing them letters, and we raised a million dollars in two weeks. And, uh, and so, uh, and I won't say I saved the campaign, because without, you know, Carter's popularity and everything else, and without the help of all these people, it wouldn't happen anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, uh, was offered, I was offered then the job of finance director for Jimmy Carter, and I, I did that job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tell us some of the, uh, there were a number of prominent people associated with the center's early founding who kind of, uh, who endorsed it. Who, who were some of those people? Well, so, some of the people that gave us credibility early on, probably the most prominent person was Julian Bond. Uh, I knew that, uh, that nobody ever heard of myself or the Southern Poverty Law Center, so if we're going to write letters out around this nation to, to list of people who gave to the ACLU and the ADL and the Wiesenthal Center and all the other liberal groups, and there weren't many, by the way, at then. Direct mail was in its infancy then. You had common cause that had just got started. So I asked a Julian Bond, and I'd never met Julian Bond before. I simply called him over in Atlanta and had lunch with him. Uh, to see if he would be willing to help us. Uh, he knew Chuck Morgan, a civil rights lawyer from Birmingham who had uh, spoke out against the bombing and had gone to Atlanta to head, to head up the ACLU. A very, very outspoken uh, guy had done a lot of great cases. And, and uh, I think it may have been Chuck even who called Julian and set up the lunch. Julian was very attentive and he listened and he agreed to be uh, titular or, or honorary, so to speak, president of the Southern Harvey Law Center. Even though he took more than an honorary role, he got active and involved. And uh, so the fir all the first letters went out under the name of Julian Bond. And, uh, and then uh, we had other people like uh, John Lewis, uh, who was uh, is now in Congress. He was on our original steering committee or, uh, I guess, President's Commission or whatever you want to call it, that guided the center. Fannie Lou Hamer, a famous uh, black woman from Mississippi. Uh, Harding Carter. Who was uh, uh, whose uh, father had a newspaper over in Mississippi, and uh, Chuck Morgan. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Morgan put his name on there or not, because the ACLU might have prescribed that. But you know, we had we had a a, a, a nice group of, of people with a lot of credentials. The Southern Poverty Law Center uh, has had really four stages or four base projects in its in its history. It started out as a legal group, and the goal was to do the cases that Joe Levin and I. Had started as private practitioners that I'd been doing even before I met Joe and turned into a nonprofit group with the imprimatur of the Southern Poverty Law Center. So for the first 10 years, that's pretty much all we did. We did a large number of cases, uh, death penalty, uh, uh, cases to, uh, dealing with uh, uh, issues of all the major issues that came before. Yeah. Voting yeah. rights. Voting rights. Employment. Uh, employment discrimination. Uh, uh, a lot of criminal issues, trying to raise raise issues of disparity based on on poverty, uh, it, it, the broad range of cases, and uh, and 
probably some of them, like uh, the Alabama State Trooper case. Uh, went to the Supreme Court eventually. To, yeah, we've had actually six cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. We, we stopped private schools from using uh, public recreation facilities, mainly football fields, that gave, their, gave them some uh, uh, benefit over public schools, and yet they didn't have to pay for them. There's a large number of cases, and, and a lot of them came out of the Middle District. Not all of them from Judge Johnson. We had some before Judge Hobbs, uh, Judge Varner, as time grew, uh, and, and other judges. But about the latter part of the uh, 1960s, about, pardon me, the latter part of the 1970s, uh, by pure accident we got involved in a case representing a black man who had been accused of assault with intent to murder of a Klansman. And it wasn't our kind of case. I actually had to be almost arm twisted to get involved in the case. And the black man had an enormously great personality. He was the singer, lead, one of the singers in the group, group that called the Coasters. And he had a deep voice and he sang that song in the uh, song Charlie Brown, Why Is Everybody Always Picking On Me? Well, he got on the phone from Decatur, Alabama and convinced me of his total innocence when he shot this Klansman. And I checked on the case, and then the case involved uh, uh, about 100 Klansmen deciding to stop a group of peaceful black demonstrators who was protesting what they thought was the unfair trial of a black man accused of raping a white woman, <coughs> kind of a classic kind of Klan involvement case. And, uh, and, and, the, and the Klan had attacked this group of black marchers who were marching down the street peacefully, uh, led by Reverend Joseph Lowry of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and they had shot at their cars and beat them up. and. And, uh, and shot a couple of black people. Uh, Curtis, in defense of himself, pulled his gun out that he had in a car, in the car with him there, and he shot a Klansman through the chest. And I represented Curtis with other lawyers at the center, and he was convicted, but the jury decided that he was a good man, and so they didn't want him to go to jail, and they gave him his job back immediately as, uh, as the maintenance director for the city of Decatur. So it was kind of a compromise, and we felt we'd won. But, uh, in working on a case, it was clear to me that those Klan groups, that hundred, they didn't just get there by accident. The FBI investigated and couldn't find anything that, uh, that showed a conspiracy that violated federal laws. Uh, and we began to investigate uh, for the possibility of a civil suit against the Klan and uh, sue that organization for the acts of their members. And so I, uh, our invest the more I investigate a check, the more we found this, this, this clan groups are scattered all around and, they, and they'd come from everywhere and they'd had meetings and et cetera. So I proposed to the uh, Board of Directors of Southern Poppy Law Center that we set up a project to track clan groups and hate groups because I was beginning to see information that this was kind of a, a rebirth of the clan. They pretty much died out after the Voting Rights March in 1965, but there'd been kind of a backlash against gangs by blacks and, and we were finding uh, you know, not, 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 uh, no big stories are being written in the national press about it, but uh, you could see that there's something going on in the country, and, and these racist groups were the first to really protest and, and do these violent things in public. So we set up Klan Watch in 1980, and that was the second major project that, uh, that really lasted as the, for the next decade as the only two projects, the Law Group and the Klan Watch Group. And the, Klan, the purpose of Klan Watch was to track hate groups, gather information, publish intelligence material to law enforcement agencies uh, in a report uh, called the Intelligence Report, and also possibly to bring civil lawsuits. And over the next 10 years, from 1980 to 1990, <coughs> I pretty much devoted my full time to several major lawsuits suing hate groups. I represented the Vietnamese fishermen down in Galveston Bay, Texas, along with our other lawyers here because the Klan was burning their boats trying to run them out of Galveston Bay. Uh, we got an injunction and stopped them. Then we ended up representing uh, a black man in Mobile in a case that uh, uh, you and other lawyers uh, worked on, you especially, uh, suing the United Klans of America. And that's the group whose members bombed the church in Birmingham who killed those four little girls. And that's the big group headed nationally located, national group but located in Alabama with a new 7,500 square foot building headed by Robert Shelton, a, an old line Klansman, and was becoming very active again. And, and one of its members, at the direction of uh, one of the minor officials in South Alabama, had lynched a black man just to prove a point that the Klan was powerful and also as, a, as kind of a statement against a case in Mobile where 
a jury had failed to convict a black man for killing a white police officer. Uh, that case resulted in a seven million dollar verdict and the taking away of the Klan's national headquarters returned the property over to the black woman and bankrupted the organization. And those cases then began to spread around the country as hate groups began to spread. It's not just a southern phenomenon. Uh, the next really major case was over in, uh, out in Oregon uh, and we sued a group called the White Aryan Resistance because some of its <coughs> members, skinheads, or some of its associates, uh, killed a young black Ethiopian student. And the most recent case we did was in Idaho against the, uh, the Aryan nations because their guards misperceived or at least thought uh, an innocent mother and her son driving down the rural road in front of their 20-acre compound were Jews. And so they attacked these people and, uh, and the judgment was for that family. And that will result in taking away of the headquarters of the United Clan, I mean of the uh, uh, Aryan nations. Uh, and, and over the years, the, uh, the Law Center has become an authority in tracking hate groups. We have, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs collected by intelligence sources and other means, uh, all categorized and, and able to respond quickly to law enforcement's uh, uh, requests of information. In addition, law enforcement people, as well as the media and the public, rely on our intelligence report, professionally edited journal, comes out quarterly, that kind of kind of keeps in focus where this movement is. And the most recent project of this organization, of uh, Klan Watch Intelligence Project, was the cooperation with HBO of a documentary uh, explaining the rise of, of hate sites on the internet. In 1995, there was one, and in the year 2000, there was 450 hate websites. And uh, in almost virtual groups being created of all types, uh, dealing with all facets of hate. Uh, in about 19, 90, we began to realize that uh, these hate crimes that, that we were tracking, reporting on in our intelligence project, actually, the large number were, were actually, actually being committed by uh, young people and who had no connection with hate groups. Probably 90 to 95 percent of all hate crimes are committed by people that have no affiliation with hate groups at all. And, uh, you know, like slashing the car tires of an interracial couple that moved in a neighborhood or or painting swastikas on cemeteries, or bashing gay people, or you name it. So we thought that it is important to not only fight hate in court, but to attack uh, hate and, uh, and teach tolerance in the classrooms. So we started a project called Teaching Tolerance. Uh, we pulled together a pretty good, uh, talented staff of writers, and we started with a magazine called Teaching Tolerance. And, and, with, and so teachers could share their stories of how they dealt with various issues of intolerance and, and ways to make students be uh, more uh, caring and loving and accepting and et cetera uh, to each other. And it's, so in today, uh, Teaching Tolerance Magazine goes to 600,000 teachers twice a year. It's well accepted in the education field. In addition, we publish uh, education kits. We have, uh, they usually contain a video, a classroom link, 30 minute or so video, a, a teacher's guide to be used with the video and a text depending on the subject. Not to say this in a bragging sense, but we put a lot of effort in these videos. Our first one uh, called A Time for Justice was a kind of a sample of America's civil rights movement. Kind of to whet the appetite of a young person, let them understand what happened in this decade this such a short time ago that most students today know little or nothing about, about the struggle for freedom by blacks in America and the part that people played. Uh, the video in this won an Oscar at the Academy Awards, and the next next uh, video we did for an uh, education kit called Shadows of Hate, telling some of the horrible things that not just happened to blacks, but that happened to uh, Asians and Mexicans and Indians and others in this nation, got an Academy nomination. As I say, I say this really not to brag about our product, but to say that we spent a lot of money and time to make our stuff work useful. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to do these video text kits. One that we're working on now is the story of Rosa Parks. And uh, Mrs. Parks uh, is acting as kind of honorary chair of a project we have called the National Campaign for Tolerance. We hope to get several million people to sign pledges for tolerance, declarations for tolerance, and, uh, and also to be a part of a, uh, an effort of individuals in this country to take uh, materials that we provide like uh, tools for tolerance and uh, ways to fight hate and try to get in their communities and make a difference. Because we think that that in the long run is going to be the answer. 
Uh, the fourth project that we've started really kind of ties all the others together, especially the Teaching Tolerance Project and the Intelligence Clan Watch Project, and that's the use of the Internet. But instead of just having a website for the Southern Poverty Law Center like so many people have, and we do and we'll continue that, we, we're, we're calling our product, product or project Tolerance.org. It's a major standalone website. Uh, fortunately, we have the support of some of America's largest uh, people in the, uh, the whole tech, high tech industry. Uh, Cisco Systems is giving us a large grant. Uh, Yahoo, the uh, internet porthole, is helping us uh, introduce our site to America and, and get young people to watch it. And in addition, we hope to, to make this site not, not just for schools and students, uh, but to go into areas like police agencies so that we can give them good material to try to stop things like racial profiling and, and uh, discrimination within the force and how to be a better, serve a community better, hopefully give ideas to churches so if they want to do something on tolerance and, and diversity they'll have materials readily available. And also we want to honor people who are doing good things uh, in this area, in corporates and, uh, and other ways. So, so those are the four projects and they're all uh, kind of work hand in glove. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is uh, as I speak, uh, about ready to move into a, its a fourth headquarters building. It's a very large, new, attractive building, some uh, 60,000 square feet in downtown Montgomery to house all these different uh, programs that we do. And how big is the Southern Poverty Law Center today <coughs> in terms of employees? The Southern Poverty Law Center today is, is getting close to having 100 employees. <coughs> we, uh, if you count the security staff we have, which is a, a kind of an unfortunate side effect of our, of our operations, uh, it would be close to 100 employees. <clears throat> and what about the size of uh, its uh, endowment now? <clears throat> well, the Southern Poverty Law Center, from the beginning, as I said, uh, has tried to make itself self-sufficient and run itself in a business-like way. <clears throat> Today, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, has an endowment of about 112 to $14 million. Uh, that certainly would not handle the budget of the center. Uh, the, the, the budget of the Senate would far exceed the income that that would produce. But since the beginning, since the first dollar we put into the center, we've continued to invest our money. A large part of this $114 million or so uh, has, has come from increases in the asset value based on the, the growth of the American stock market. But we try every year to put some of the money our donors give us, from 10 to 20 percent of it, we try to put it into the endowment. And our donors are encouraged to to support our endowment also, so that we'll get it into the range of a half a billion dollars. And you know, to some people this might seem like a lot of money, and it certainly is, but there are colleges in America with a billion dollars endowment that have a few thousand students. Uh, Harvard has sixteen billion dollars, and I'm not trying in any way to compare us to Harvard or some of these schools, but the Southern Poverty Law Center reaches millions of students. Uh, we we <coughs> estimate that of the 52 million students that are in K through 12 in the United States today, uh, we'll probably reach 25 million of them with our material. Mm -hmm. And if you count the number we've reached since 1990, it'd probably go into two or 300 million students have been exposed to our materials, uh, teaching tolerance materials. Marsh, you mentioned um, the security force, and I know you earlier mentioned how the uh, Klan had broken into your building. Uh, uh, Tell uh, the people who are watching this about um, uh, the problems we had back in the mid-80s with the Klan. Well, as soon as, as soon as the Poverty Law Center took on the Klan in court, uh, especially the Klan in Texas, who was harassing the Vietnamese fishermen, um, we began to uh, be harassed by Klansmen. I knew the first time I went to Decatur, Alabama, in fact, I, I put my uh, Beretta in my briefcase, first time I ever did that as a lawyer, uh, and I, I took it with me because I knew the reputation of the Klan. And I remember the young lawyer who was with me was kind of, you know, snickering that I had a gun that I laid on the bedside table as we investigated the case in Decatur where the Klan beat up the black people. But it wasn't long before the reality of my fears came to play because as soon as we got the injunction against the Klan down in Texas, uh, and even before we sued about the death of the young black man in Mobile, uh, a group of Klansmen uh, broke into our building uh, in the middle of the night and, uh, and set it on fire. Uh, after about a year and a half investigation, uh, we found out that the, perfect, the guy behind it all was a member of the, of the board of directors of the Klan group from Texas, the uh, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He was a fire chief of a small 
town south of Montgomery. He put two young Klan members of his to come in, in there and burn that building. He was convicted and received, uh, uh, you know, 15 years in prison. And since then, there have been numerous threats. Uh, too many to mention. Uh, that the last count that I made, and, and, and I'm counting one whole group of 20 people who went to prison, it wasn't totally because of us, but there's been close to 40 people today who are in prison, who have served prison time for attempts to, uh, to harm people who work at the law center or to harm our property. You've mentioned some of the uh, uh, lawyers who have worked here, uh, but I, I, I thought, uh I know John Carroll worked here, and he is now a United States magistrate. Tell us about John's connection here. Well, I think, I think it's impressive that the lawyers that have come through the Law Center have gone on to, to do very important things. And John Carroll is a classic example of, of those lawyers. Uh, John uh, didn't graduate from any you know, big law school. Actually, he went to Cumberland Law School. In the, in the, in the sphere of law schools, it you know, would be uh, just an average law school. Extremely bright guy. Went to Harvard, got a a master's in constitutional law and came to work for us uh, as, as an associate to work with us uh, to help us on cases. It soon became evident that he was a very skilled lawyer, a good writer, a, a, a prodigious worker, and, uh, and John stayed here for until he decided that he wanted to teach and, and he uh, for a short time practiced privately until he got a teaching assignment. He got the teaching assignment at Mercer and from there, he ended up being drafted by the judges of the Middle District of Alabama to become a United States magistrate. He's uh, as qualified as any, any judge on the district court to try cases, and I think a, 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 a credit to him is that uh, most of the time he's trying cases that have a binding effect as if he's a federal judge by the agreement of the parties because they want to get their litigation completed. Uh, we've had many other lawyers who've come through. I don't want to slight anybody by not mentioning them, but Pamela Horowitz uh, is one of outstanding lawyers that came to us, uh, later went on to go into private practice in, uh, Bur in Washington, D.C. with Chuck Morgan, and uh, later married Julian Bond, the, uh, uh, one of the co-founders of the Southern Poverty Law Center. So, and we've had uh, Ira Burnham, who uh, has worked with the uh, uh, Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C., and is, uh, is one of the most outstanding lawyers in American juvenile law. Steve Ellman, who worked with us for a, a long time. Uh, Steve uh, is now uh, in New York <coughs> as a law professor. Uh, Chuck Abernathy, who was one of the first lawyers we employed. Chuck uh, ended up uh, working at Georgetown, uh, and actually he helps teach judges how to write. Uh, Chuck is one of the brightest people that ever came through. He's a Harvard Law graduate. Uh, Joe Levin obviously started the Law Center with me, and he's back now after leaving and practicing law and working in the court administration. He's back now as president of the Law Center and day-to-day -day job here. Uh, uh, we've had Dennis Balski, a, a bright lawyer from Ohio. Uh, he was a taught criminal uh, practice and procedures at, uh, at the uh, law school in Ohio. Uh, he came here and worked with us. Did did tremendous work in death penalty in the death penalty area. And, uh, and then uh, left to be a public defender in Oregon. We had Deb Ellis, who came and worked with us. Many of these people clerked for Judge Johnson. Uh, Deb was a, was a very bright lawyer and, just, and just went on to do work in, uh, with the National Organization for Women, and I really don't know exactly what she's doing today. Uh, Howard Mandel. And, and, and I was going to mention Howard <coughs> Mandel was another clerk for Judge Johnson, who uh, is now on our board of directors, and, and Howard is... Uh, uh, now city attorney for Montgomery, which is quite a switch. When uh, the Montgomery's involved years ago with trying to stop blacks from using public recreation, and now we have Howard Mandel, uh, one of our lawyers who worked for us, is acting as city attorney. So, you know, things are changing here. And I'm sure I've, I've missed mentioning a lot of lawyers. We have a lot of lawyers who work for us now that haven't left that, are, that uh, uh, all are doing terrific work. Just uh, say a word or two, if you would, about the Civil Rights Memorial. Uh, the, the Civil Rights Memorial is, uh, is probably one of the things that the center is most known for in America. Uh, when uh, you and I represented Mrs. Beulah McDonald, whose son was lynched by the Klan, uh, it, it brought a lot of attention to the center, and I got an opportunity, along with Mrs. Donald, to appear before a national group to speak about the case. She and I appeared before an NAACP convention and was giving both of us an, an award for the case. And after the speech was over, several young people came up to me and said, look, uh, 
We heard you mention in your speech those who died in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. King and Medgar Evers and Vilo Uzo, and you mentioned several others. And <clears throat> uh, we know Dr. King died, but uh, and these are young people. And they said, well, who is Vilo Uzo? And who is Medgar Evers? And, uh, and I said, wow, you know, and, I, and as I was thinking about it later, I came back to the law center and I said, you know, who did die in the Civil Rights Movement? I, mean, I don't know either. So we, you know, I knew of obvious people, four girls in Birmingham, you know, and we always thought Emmett Till was one, and uh, Medgar Evers I knew about, Violet Uzo got killed out there on the highway from Montgomery. So I had our researchers begin to check, and also I proposed building a memorial in Montgomery to honor those people who died. Uh, we found famous books on the Civil Rights Movement that only listed some 20 people. So our researchers found 40 people that you could credibly say died in connection with the Civil Rights Movement, killed by hate groups because of, of uh, the hate groups wanted to get rid of people, uh, killed because of their active role in the Civil Rights Movement, like uh, Ben Evers, or uh, in some way their death caused a national outcry, like Emmett Till. So we came up with 40 names, and. Uh, and one of our board members, Eddie Ashworth, uh, kind of a brazen guy in many ways, decided, why don't we get Ma Lin to do this? She had just done the Vietnam War Memorial. Uh, we contacted Vietnam War Memorial, and they you know, wasn't too helpful in, in invading her privacy by giving us her home phone number. And she was a young woman and just out of Yale School of Architecture. But we found her name and contacted her. She flew to Montgomery and, uh, and said that she would love to do the project and said that it had to have something to do with water because she had read on a plane down Dr. King's <coughs> I Have a Dream speech. We had provided her with some material. And in it he used the, the line out of the Book of Amos uh, that's uh, in so many speeches that let's not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So she said this thing has to have something to do with water. And, uh, and hence the memorial is, involves a large disc that uh, has water flowing up through the center, spreading out in the sheeting and sheets over the stories of the 40 people that died along interspersed with the incidences, date chronological, like the bus boycott and the Brown versus Boyd decisions and all, and ending with the death of Dr. King, 1954 to, to 1968 when Dr. King was killed. And then there's a big beautiful wall where water uh, goes over uh, the words from the Book of Amos Dr. King used. And, you know, several hundred thousand people a year come through Montgomery and, and walk around this memorial and put their hands in the water. And I think it's probably one of the most satisfying things that I personally uh, experience is looking out the window uh, down at, at a group of young people who had no knowledge of the Civil Rights Movement uh, and sometimes uh, little kids being lifted up by their families, <coughs> parents, and, and as parents point out, oh, I remember this, I remember that, and trying to explain to them what it's all about. And then sometimes <clears throat> groups of kids circling it, you know, around, touching the water like Miley and figured they probably would, you know, putting their names, their hands on the names of people who died in the movement and, uh, and, and learning a bit of history. So it's the Civil Rights Movement is really, a, you know, kind of a, a symbol. If that could be a, a piece of art or a piece of a memorial or a statement about what we stand for, I think it would be the message that's sent out by the Civil Rights Movement. And um, I think you could best sum it up, as Maya Lin did. And it not only tells us where we've been, but where we have to go. And many of those entries on the uh, memorial, I know, are uh, events that were tied to the Middle District of Alabama. A large number of the events. In fact, uh, uh, Montgomery is the birthplace of the Civil Rights Movement. It was the court that Judge Johnson sat on, and Judge Reeves, and uh, and uh, other and another federal judge, uh, three judge court, that ultimately uh, ended segregation on the buses in Montgomery. Viola Luzo was killed on the march from Selma to Montgomery, and it was uh, uh, a ruling by Judge Johnson that allowed the march to take place, an unprecedented march down 40 or 50 miles of highway, stopping the highway, guarded by National Guard because. Uh, the, uh, uh, as he said in his opinion, the uh, enormity of the wrong, and that is to deny the right to vote of thousands of black people in Alabama, uh, certainly called for an enormous remedy. And therefore, that was, the, that was the decision that came out of the court. But people lost their lives in that. Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed in Marion County along about that time because of protests, Marion County's near Selma. 
uh, Reverend James Reed was uh, beaten over the head by a lead pipe by a group of thugs on the street of Selma as he was down there preparing for the march. And then after the march was over, the very night after it was over, a group of Ku Klux Klansmen drove up beside the car driven by Violet Rizzo and shot her through the window. Would you think that the uh, statement from Dr. King on the wall is a uh, <clears throat> fair summation of what the Southern Poverty Law Center itself is about? I think it is because, you know, you, you always run up against different issues at different times and, uh, and it's easy to get frustrated. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we see changes of administration in Washington. We just experienced a drastic change in, you know, a, a very divided nation uh, in the election of President Bush. And, uh, and, and new issues will arise out of this. They'll deal with the environment. They'll deal with the distribution of health care, uh, who gets the prescription drugs and who doesn't and what price they pay, access to services, uh, the access to educational facilities, jobs, and other things. And sometimes these things are rooted in the whole concept of fairness and justice. And uh, I think you could say, as Dr. King said, and as uh, Amos told uh, the leaders of the town that he went to because he felt that they weren't being fair to all the people then, that unless you're fair to everybody, then you're not going to continue to operate as a nation and you're not going to continue to have all the good things you have. And I think the message here at the law is, is that we are not going to be satisfied until justice does roll down like waters. And it's not always a thing that happens in the courts. Uh, we think it happens in the classrooms. We think it happens in businesses. And we think it happens in police stations. And where people in this nation uh, meet each other, talk to each other, and have to deal with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Morris, thank you. You're welcome.